Welcome. Welcome to Fearless with Jason Whitlock. I am Jason Whitlock, your host. Happy Wednesday. Happy hump day. Glad you're here with us. We have a fantastic show uh, planned today. Of course, with it being Wednesday, we'll have some Tennessee Harmony. Anthony Walker will be here. Virgil Walker will be here via Skype. But man, do we have a full house? Oh my God, I even forgot. Coach JB's gonna be here. Mm. We got we got a full house today. JB will not be in Tennessee Harmony. I <laughs> just want to be clear. But we got a full house. Steve Kim in studio. Round of applause. Yes, Steve uh, Kim. TJ Mo. Mike is new, by the way. He's working the camera. When I say round of applause, Mike, that includes you as well. Uh, TJ Mo in studio. Round of applause. Thank you. And hey, we've never had this guy in studio. We've never had him on the show, as far as I know. Jamar. Johnson, a comedian from Texas, and someone who uh, participates in our Wednesday prayer call, where I've never seen you, Steve. Uh, Jamar Johnson in studio as well. Oh, Round of applause. Yes, uh, man, it's loaded and packed in here, and we've got a lot to discuss. We're going to start off with a topic that I think has implications on all of the sports world, and and. I, then we're going to transition back into a little Dion Sanders discussion, some leftover stuff from yesterday that I want to get uh, JB's take on and everyone here with me's take on. And then we'll end Tennessee Harmony also still talking about Dion Sanders. Last night on a Twitter Spaces, I analogized Dion uh, to the Tulsa minister, Mike Todd. Uh, that I've been criticized because at one point I was a fan of Mike Todd and Virgil loves to come in and tap dance on my grave that I was wrong about that and Delano calls me out for it, Anthony calls me out for it. Uh, well now, I, I, I compared Dion to Mike Todd and not everyone liked it, but uh, you'll have to stay tuned uh, for that conversation. But let's start with what's going on with ESPN and Charter Cable. This is fascinating. I, th there's a dispute, and right now you can't get ESPN, ABC, or any of the Disney channels on Charter Spectrum. This is affecting about 15 million uh, people. A lot of sports fans shocked over the weekend uh, when they couldn't get, when football kicked off, when the U.S. Open's going, and you can't get ESPN if you're a Charter Spectrum uh, uh, user and Charter Spectrum is, I believe, uh, the second largest cable provider in the United States. This dispute over carriage fees, over the, the ten dollars a month that everybody pays to ESPN, whether they're a sports fan or not. Charter Spectrum is basically saying cable news is over, the bundle is over, the, the whole model does not work. There have been many stories written about this. This started late last week, again, or it came to a head late last week, and things seem to be escalating and escalating and escalating as this thing's not getting settled. And now we're headed, we're just a few days away from Thursday, the NFL season kicks off on NBC. It kicks off on ESPN on Monday with Monday Night Football involving the New York Jets. That's a large market, has plenty of charter spectrum users. If there is no Aaron Rodgers and the New York Jets in that New York market, that's a major problem. But beyond all of that, and, and this is why I, I want to talk about it, just the, the feud and the dispute and the possible demise of just cable TV as a whole is fascinating. For those of us that are sports fans, the potential collapse of ESPN. Many people are writing about this. This charter spectrum deal could impact deals ESPN has with other cable providers and could lead to the collapse of ESPN. This isn't hyperbole. These are respected people at major uh, news organizations and outlets and uh, newspapers from the Wall Street Journal. Everybody's writing about like, hey, this could legitimately destroy ESPN. ESPN. Disney is trying to offshoot or get rid of ESPN or partner with the NBA or the NFL. 
ESPN is out over its skis. It's no longer a cash cow. If, if cable providers follow Charter Spectrum's uh, lead here and start playing hardball, and because let's say, we'll just use a round number, a thousand people have Charter Spectrum. Of that thousand, maybe 200 of that thousand are sports fans that want ESPN. The other 800 people are paying that $10 for ESPN and they never use it, don't have an interest in it, don't want it. ESPN's been getting away with murder for decades. And that's what made them all powerful. And that's what also has fueled the rest of the American sports leagues. ESPN and the deals they cut with the NBA, the NFL, Major League Baseball, is all powered and fueled by this grift they've been getting away with for decades. This is a major story that I'm not sure, uh, again, ESPN's not gonna be the worldwide leader in this coverage. They don't want you to know what's going on. They don't want you to realize how desperate they are, but did, did we uh, gather, yeah, we got the Stephen A tweets. I find this very fascinating. Stephen A. Smith, who's paid 10, 11, 12 million dollars a year by ESPN. When, when Stephen A. is tweeting out, this is an actual tweet from his Twitter page. Don't know if you all heard all the news going on in the charter markets with Spectrum, but folks are once again coming after the worldwide leader. Fans currently don't have access to live games on ESPN networks or any content from Disney branded channels, Freeform, FX, Nat Geo. If you are personally affected, if you want to see ESPN for live games, the US Open, or anything else your heart desires from the sports world, you can visit this website, keepmynetworks.com, for information about where you can get it. Bottom line, you have choices. Direct TV stream, Hulu Plus, Live TV, YouTube TV, Sling, FUBU are all available. Just download the app and sign up with no service call. <clears throat> that is a prepared statement by Stephen A. Smith. When I say prepared, I mean edited, <laughs> looked over by management, constructed by management. Steve, they're calling in the troops. They have a three alarm fire going off at ESPN and that Stephen A, quit running your mouth, uh, quit you know, your, your YouTube deal, come on, we need you to come over here and put out a statement. It speaks to how desperate and how dire this situation is for ESPN when they have to bring in someone like Stephen A. Smith to put out these types of statements. These type statements normally come from PR firms and come from up Jimmy Pataro. They're calling in their talent basically to beg people to find another option other than Charter Spectrum. It speaks to just how serious this is, just how desperate ESPN is. And I think that those of us that are sports fans, those of us that talk about sports for a living, we need to have this conversation and understand just how big this is. I'm not sure, and, and well, I take that back. I'm not sure if the typical athlete <clears throat> understands from the overpaid NBA and NFL players. I'm not sure. They take all this money they're making for granted. If ESPN collapses and that business model collapses, it could dramatically change American sports leagues. It could change the amount of money these leagues can shower on these players. Look, maybe someone like Apple buys ESPN and all the financial problems go away. But I'm not sure if all the financial problems go away because even Apple, that's got as much cash as any corporation or any business on the planet, things have to make economic sense. They still have to operate like a business. ESPN has not had to operate like a real business for decades because they've been able, again, go back to my analogy, thousand people have charter spectrum, 
200 of them want ESPN, all 1,000 of them pay for ESPN. That's a unfair monopoly. That's an un. The ESPN's been exploiting 800 people, 80 percent of the people who don't have an interest in their product. Could you imagine? Hey, I'm a watch salesman, and there's three people in my neighborhood uh, that want to buy a watch from me. But everybody in my neighborhood is required to buy a watch from me. Does that make me a great salesman or does that make me someone that has an unfair advantage? Unfair advantage is what ESPN has had. A lot of these uh, other cable networks have had, but particularly ESPN. And so if that goes away at Apple, they're just not gonna spend the money as indiscriminately as ESPN has because they won't have that unfair advantage. This is huge what's going on between ESPN and Charter Spectrum. I'm going to open the floor because I'm sure I haven't touched on everything that's relevant here. And so I want to open the floor to Steve Kim and TJ Moe and Jamar, and perhaps they have additional thoughts. Steve, I'll let you fire first. Uh, just what do you find fascinating about this whole dispute? Well, the spinning of both parties uh, you got these two conglomerates and it reminds me of that you know that spider-man meme where they're pointing at each other yeah so these are the two spider-mans but they have guns but the only difference is we are we are the fans in the middle so spider-man us spider-man and we're just putting the gun to our heads and we're thinking neither of you are the good guys here and i like a lot of americans was looking forward to football palooza 2023 up until about 3.59, I'm looking at ESPN coverage. I had all... What day is this? This is Thursday. Gotcha. Right before Utah, Florida. Gotcha. So there's other games on, CBS Sports, Fox. I had my various ways of watching those all at once. And then uh, this is where I think it is almost borders on extortion, what they're doing. So at 4 o'clock, I'm looking forward to going to Rice Eccles Stadium. It's just black. I'm so old school, I actually tap my TV going, what's going on here? <laughs> and so I'm starting to, like, this is the truth. I start going to other channels, and some of the channels are fine. But then there's other blackouts. And I'm thinking, okay, ACC Network, I just lost the Wake Forest game. SEC Network, I just lost the game. I'm thinking, what is going on? And it was about 15 minutes later, the notice went up. The famous notice, and all the Twitter's talking about it. And the first thought I had was, you had all summer and you know the hold that football has. And college football is the second biggest television ratings getter in sports TV in general. And all of a sudden, you knew this was coming and you did nothing to solve it. And I tell you what, when it really hit home with me. So on Sunday, I wanted to watch the LSU Florida State game, best game of the weekend. So I'm thinking, okay, you know what? I'm good. It's ABC. It's just regular TV. I can get that on my antenna. So at, I think, 4.30, I turned it over and I had no idea. I had completely forgotten. That's Disney. And, but I tell you what it was found out. We will find alternative ways to watch events. I'll just leave it at that. Don't want to incriminate myself, <laughs> but I watched the game. I don't want to say how. I don't, I don't want to say who provided me, because quite frankly, I'm going to need these guys for the next couple of weeks. And on Saturday, I was at Coach JB's house, his cigar bar, which is just opulent. He had three different TVs. He had a different way of watching the games legally. I believe he had YouTube TV. Mm -hmm. So we had football on three screens. They better understand one thing, and you brought this up over lunch yesterday. When you take away something that we like, that we take for granted so much, you know what happens, Jason? We get used to not having it. Mm -hmm. You are now creating different viewing habits, mm -hmm. options, and now you're creating different type of ways to us to keep us entertained. Now, with me, I'm going to watch my college football because I need to. But my belief is, gentlemen, a lot of people that are more casual about this, they'll just do other things. So I'm trying to look up as we're saying this. Do you remember the NHL strike? Yeah. It, it probably took a decade for them to recover. The NHL went on strike and people thought, oh, I don't need hockey. What a, hockey was good, but yeah. oh well. And they never came back. And part of your, because you know, this has been happening since 20, was it 2015? There was about 100 million TV subscribers, something like that. 12, 15, somewhere in there. And it's been going down. Now we're down to about 70 million. And uh, I think as a, we all sit here and live in a major bubble. 
because we're part of that 20%. And we need the college football games. We need all of them. We need every network. And I don't care if they're if you're the bottom feeder in the SEC, like my Missouri Tigers have been for the last couple of years, I still want to watch them. But I realize my grandmother, who doesn't know how to turn on the sports channels, is also paying for this. Mm. So sports figures have such, and I'm talking us too in the media, Stephen A. Smith. I think Adam Schefter is getting paid nine million bucks a year. Adrian Wojnarowski is even paid seven million bucks a year. The salaries are so overinflated, and then gives them this idea of how important they are. We're living amongst amongst a group of nobodies. That the I used to think naively that you know I, I could go in the Patriots locker room and everybody knows the players just like I do, and then I realized at some point, oh, they only know Tom Brady across the world. That's it. Nobody knows anybody else in this locker room except for Tom Brady. And a lot of people only know him because he's married to a supermodel. And that's just the truth of it. And so we, we, we live now, we're, we're coming back to reality. We, we have had this bubble of 10 to 15 years where people will get generational wealth and that's going away, rightfully so. And sports need to take this hit. TJ, Jamar, before you get I got it. Yes. TJ has gone to a point that I definitely wanted to get to. Stephen A. Smith, Shannon Sharp, Skip Bayless, Colin Cowherd, Jason Whitlock for a time, lived in a fantasy world where, again, and let's, I'll zero in on Stephen A. Smith, I'm not trying to pick on him, but this is what this unfair advantage that ESPN's had has allowed. Because again, when 80% of the people have no interest in ESPN, but they're footing the bill, that's why Stephen A. Smith, with 400,000 viewers a day, can get paid $10 million. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's never made sense. Oh. It's a fantasy world he's been able to live in because they have a monopoly. And, and uh, I, I was just telling someone, like, you know, Tucker Carlson had three and a half million viewers a night and got paid, they say, $20 million. He's got eight to nine times the viewers mm-hmm. as Stephen A. Smith but only makes twice as much money. This is the fantasy world well, that these guys have lived in, and they're about to get a wake-up call, and that's why Stephen A's tweeting out things. That's why Stephen A's trying to build a YouTube channel. It, it's, every, he's like, oh my God, I'm about to, because, and this is like, Stephen A, and, and, and w- w- the way the cable thing all worked, create, and it's not just Stephen A, I wanna take him off the, off the crosshairs a little bit. Just think of all the other cable channels where we've created all these TV stars. And again, I'm old enough, Steve's old enough to remember, there used to be three channels. And you had to be really talented Mm -hmm. and really good to be a star and to make big money. With this explosion of cable, all these people have been running around, I'm a celebrity, I'm a star, (laughs) I'm an influencer, I'm a brand. And they're on these little offshoot networks with shows that, that don't really amount to anything. And we've granted them a level of importance and what they say matters. And at the end of the day, Stephen A doesn't matter. Cowherd doesn't matter. Skip doesn't matter. Uh, Shannon Sharp, Molly Karam, and all these people that have been getting paid these exorbitant salaries. In the real world, they don't matter. And now it, it, it's if... If this thing goes the way it appears to be going, they're actually going to have to join the real world and eat what they kill. And in the same way that, I'm sorry, Jamar, that we'll say Colin Coward and uh, when you were there, you guys were subsidizing Bamani Jones. Yeah. The rest of these viewers are subsidizing the sports world. It's the same thing. It's like when you look at it like that, people like, nobody cares about Bahamani Jones, but he got paid millions of dollars or at least high hundreds of thousands of dollars to be on a network subsidized by people with actual talent like you and the others. That is what's happening on a large scale here in sports. Most people care nothing about sports. In, in our little bubble, we think people care. And I go talk to the average person on the street and they can't tell you who played in last year's Super Bowl. They don't have the slightest clue. So, I might struggle. Go ahead. So what's happening is called the collapse of the decadent veil. Sports has been a veil that kept us kind of bread and circus, paying attention to things that really don't matter at at the core of it. That's what sports was. And think about who's who's the number one and number two advertisers for all of the most of the sports that happens. Think about it. I want you to think. I'm not going to say it. Big Pharma. Big Pharma. Yeah. Yeah. 
So when people, when, when things happen and people start cutting around. cords, still. Uh-huh. When, when people cut the cord and start changing up their habits, as Steve Kim just mentioned, right? What happens is that people start to reassess what's really important to their lives. They start to take some time and focus on things that really matter. And when they change those habits and they start cutting cords and start realizing, wait a minute, I don't need to pay for all of these things. I need these three things right here. And that will suffice. That sucks all of the air out of the economics. And what happens is when that collapse of the decadent veil happens is that those salaries start coming down. And now people start thinking about other things to do with their time, with their effort growing up. Instead of, I want to go be a sports star, you're thinking about, I need to learn how to program. I need to learn how to do these other things. The collapse of the decadent veil is what's happening right now. Yeah, uh, you know, Steve, let me ask. Yeah, the decadent veil. Because I was looking. Is that an original? Or so, that- so, so, where I got that from is a guy named Antonio Moore, who's an attorney out of Los Angeles, who I, I did a podcast with about five years ago. We were talking about economics, and the decadent veil is why they prop up certain celebrities <laughs> to give people the illusion that hey, if I did it, you can make it. And and we're gonna get to it later with Dion, but. Dion's a part of that whole game of the decadent veil. That's part of his job. He could have said three card Monty and that would have passed off for Royce. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, uh, to me what Stephen A. Smith does is what I call something out of the shouting down from the ivory tower. He's basically telling everybody, hey you peasants, someone's gotta pay for all this, me. Get back on cable, yep. right now. And there, there's a parallel that I see every time I go do the three knockdown rule at Universal city or studios when I have to go up there to the uh, to do that show the writers the actors writer strike is going on and I see a lot of these people protesting Mm -hmm. and there's not a lot of sympathy for me and and I draw a parallel to ESPN and Disney for about a decade they have just propagated anti-american values throughout their programming as has Hollywood they have shouted down and pointed the finger at the American people saying, you are bad, you are racist, you are prejudiced. we got to strike down this system that has made this country the greatest force in all the world. They've looked at us um, as evil beings just for espousing non-woke views. So now when they go on strike or now they suffer, they expect people like us to have sympathy. <laughs> and I'm not going to lie to you. When, when I see some of these actors talking about we need our rights, like that little actress, uh, that's, that's complaining all the time about what Snow White is. Yeah, right? I oh, just looked at her today. Yeah, her. Well, I call her Snow Brown because she's actually Latina, so that's yeah. a little bit of cultural appropriation. <laughs> but she actually got on and said, I, need to, I deserve every penny that is streamed from all my shows. And I'm thinking to myself, you know what? Uh, the sense of entitlement that you have, and that Stephen A is showing to a certain degree, even as a puppet, you're not going to get the sympathy of the American people. I think 10, 15 years ago, people would have been of this mindset, we need ESPN, give us ESPN regardless. Now I think there's almost an ESPN slash Disney mindset because, and and every time I I pass by these people on the picket lines, and I know some of them are just making, are scraping by a living, part of me wants to scream out my window, go go learn how to code, because what you're doing is not that important. It's not. And it's, 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 it's subsidized. They're, they're, mm-hmm. they're living on welfare. They're welfare kings and queens to some degree. And, and again, just like you said, not all of them are, are getting rich. But the, and, and not only that, not just welfare kings and queens, they're selling poison. Mm-hmm. The, 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 the stuff that they're writing, many of them don't believe in. They don't believe in what they're writing or they've adopted those values just because this is the only way to get paid. I, 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 I got to be careful here, but I've, I've got a longtime former friend. Uh, he, he jumped ship on me because, you know, I don't hate Trump and, and him and his girl. But, but I watched this dude. We're very good friends. And this is before everything turned super political. We were very good friends. And, and I gotta be careful how I unpack it, but the guy now, he's a Hollywood writer or whatever, and basically the only movie I've seen him get published or produced or whatever, it was some gay movie, it was some gay love story movie. I'm like, that ain't this dude. This is who he became in order to survive in Hollywood and get a movie made, but it's like, 
No, nah, that's not that, that 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 that's not that's not who I know. We we went to the same strip clubs together. We trips to Vegas with girlfriends and all that together. And now he's transition. He's making gay movies or writing gay movies to survive in Hollywood. And and I'm just like they're they're all of the woke agenda, all the anti-American sentiment, all the anger and animus that's laced in all of these shows. Yeah, pe people, people. You're right, Steve. Pe repelled. Think about it, Jason. Uh, we discussed this last year. Last year, ESPN during the women's NCAA hoops tournament. They broke into a halftime of a game. I think the score's like 43 to 4, right? So they were obviously covering the spread. But Molly Duncan gets on. And she tells the American L. people. L. Duncan. L. Duncan, yeah, okay, her. She Both says that Molly Karen's bad, too. Yeah, Molly, bad. yeah. But Miss Duncan actually lectures us on why we should all be for abortion, right? Wasn't that what she talked about? Or reproductive rights? Um, yeah, it was the strike down a Roe v. Wade. Right. Yeah. And then said, all right, now back to our scheduled programming for those 50 people watching that game. <laughs> but if you so, so think about this. If you told the average American that you talked about, the other 80% that does not care about sports, or even some of the 20% that is completely offended by that message, if you were to tell them, hey, you know what, that particular network that's the megaphone for that political agenda they are now off the air. I think a lot of people would actually say, good. Well, and that's, that's kind of the point that, that I think that between the two of you are getting to. The rubber's actually meeting the road. We're actually getting back to a meritocracy instead of subsidized corporate opinions. Because that's what ESPN has been. The 80% that don't even know what ESPN is saying, they're all paying for these woke nonsense opinions. It doesn't matter what you say because you're going to get paid off anyway. So what happens now when it goes to an a la carte model where you mm. actually have to say something that interests your viewers because it's not just going to be subsidized. So we may actually get to a point that this could be a good thing because as you pointed out, I don't know that ESPN is a sellable asset right now. I just pulled up a New York Times mm. article. They have $100 billion worth of contracts out right now. And not only though, that's just the NBA, NFL, I mean, they're paying $2.6 billion per year for Monday Night Football, right? I mean, the, the contracts they have out there, on top of the contracts paying, again, Stephen A. Smith and Adam Schefter and all these people, the money they have out there versus what they're bringing in right now, I don't know that Apple wants a shot at that. Why? You can't back out of these contracts. Uh, maybe you could, but I... Right, so you you have all... I'll bankruptcy and... <laughs> Restructure. <laughs> yeah, you... you you're starting over, though, and then and that gets into the sports well, league. They're too. morally bankrupt. Now they're going to be financially bankrupt. Well, and that's the deal. I but mean. the point is, for the first time, and you hit on this in a private conversation, Stephen A. Smith may have to pay attention to what comes out of his mouth because if somebody doesn't like it, he may not get paid. And to, and to that point, we used to be a nation of shopkeepers. So when you mentioned, Jason, people need to learn how to eat, eat what they kill, a lot of these people, like the, the talent on these sets, they think that they're, the talent is the least important thing on a movie. You're replaceable because everyone wants to do that job. So the value of it is lowered. When you have to eat what you kill, you have to develop skills that make you sustainable independently. And we need to move back that, to that as a nation if we're going to withstand what's going to happen as these interest rates rise and as the economy slows down. We, we're... we're one thought that just ran through my mind listening to you is, you know there's talk, and this isn't directly related to ESPN, but it's more cable, that AI mm. potentially could replace actors. I, and writers. And, right. It actors goes back to the Hollywood strike, though. That is an issue. Absolutely. I've been using AI for two years within my business. And where it's at in the last six months, if you know anything about ChatGPT 3.5 to, to, to 4.0, it went from about 120 IQ to 150 IQ on its own. It is going to be able to produce things on a whole new level, realistic video, in a matter of 12 to 24 months. Now, I will say that what I've read about that to some degree is the writers aren't overly concerned because for whatever reason, I don't know the specifics of it, computers don't know what's interesting to humans. They just, Neither do these guys, but go ahead. I got it. Uh, <laughs> like, you can write a story and have these components, but they can't figure out the human element. They're computers. But, but here's, there is something. But here's, but here's the thing. If what happens is, is the, the ability of one person to manage systems that can produce output oh, sure. at a yeah, 10 yeah. times rate. So what it is, is AI won't replace people completely. 
people who know how to use it will replace people. So what's happening, and so I've already, I've been talking to people in Hollywood, they're saying, hey listen, the showrunner used to come to the set and have maybe three to five writers to help make revisions before they began shooting the pilots. Now, the contracts that they're giving these showrunners are saying, hey, you show up by yourself, no extra money for the other writers, and we want you to produce the same output. And the reason they'll be able to, to do it is because they can use AI to do the majority of the work, and then they can come back and edit the, the last 5% to get, it, to get it the rest of the way. Here's, you know, before I make my next point, I, I wanna take care of uh, one of our favorite sponsors, if not our favorite sponsor, uh, Preborn. You guys know I love Preborn, we love Preborn. It is my prayer that one day there will come a day when abortion will be abolished. Then we will look back and see the atrocity of what has been done. We are experiencing the impact of abortion in our lives, the breakdown of families, the trauma that comes from a woman being pressured to have an abortion, and the steep decline of morality that justifies this atrocity. How then shall we respond? Do we stand back and say, this too shall pass? Or do we rise up and say, I will stand for the innocent? Preborn stands for the helpless, and because of your generosity, Preborn is able to offer free ultrasounds to women. Once she hears that heartbeat, the chance of choosing life more than double. And years from now, when your grandchildren ask you, what did you do, Grandpa, Grandma, what did you do to fight abortion? You can say, I saved a life through Preborn. I saved many lives. One ultrasound is just $28 to save a life. Just dial pound 250 and say the keyword baby. That's pound 250, baby. Or give the Jason Whitlock way, preborn.com slash Jason. That's preborn.com slash Jason. Uh, make sure you guys tune in tomorrow for our fearless uh, football cookout. Brett Favre, Warren Sapp, Seth Joyner, Sage Steele, all in studio here with me uh, tomorrow. This is a live event tomorrow starting at 4 p.m. Central Time on YouTube and Blaze TV. Uh, I want to pivot back, guys, to, uh, to our, our, our conversation Ah, I just, I had my next point. Oh, here's what, what's about to happen potentially. And, and this is where I, I want to have this conversation. Steve, you'll, you'll be interested on this. Is like, was ESPN ever great or did they just have a monopoly? Because I'm not sure if they were ever great. And, and what, what could happen here. It, it, that TJ alluded to, I think Jamar alluded to a little bit, is like, for the first time in 30 years, ESPN's actually going to have to care about the sports fan and actually care about who their audience is. And for a long time, they haven't cared. They've spit on their audience, literally. Jamel Hill and all these people that really don't like sports, using sports to do a different agenda. Ryan Clark, the, the, the tweet he put out, the apology he put out a week or two ago where he apologized for being critical of Tua Tungvalu or cracking a joke on Tua, and he writes, I, I went into broadcasting for, for two things, to uh, win the respect or uh, win the respect of coaches, players, executives, staff and blah, blah, none of it had to, anything to do with serving sports fans. ESPN's model, serving sports fans anytime, anywhere. None of that was on Ryan Clark's radar. He's there to service coaches, yeah. athletes, executives and staff, and they don't even, under, they live in such a fantasy world, they don't even know they have a business and that the customer is always right. They haven't cared about their customers. And, and that's where I think this could actually be a good thing is they're actually gonna have to care about the customer again. Well, Jason, to your question, what, were they ever great or were they only great because they were a monopoly? Look, I am very biased about this. I was an ESPN junkie as a child of the 80s. I'll never forget the first time I ever saw it my family visited another family that happened to have cable. And there was this channel called Espen, and they're showing CFL. First time I ever saw Warren Moon. So that thing ends, and then later on, they had this show called Sports Center, and I'm just watching this, and I said, wait a minute. They're doing 30 minutes of nothing but sports. Not your usual three minutes at the local thing. Then when we ended up getting, I was in Valencia, California, we got a cable-ready TV, those things, which meant you can get ESPN and scrambled porn. Now, back to the original thing. Um, and, and prize fights, pay-per-view fights, like listening to the radio. But I, 
I would literally watch the half hour version of Sports Center with guys like Tom Meese, and then they would replay it at the bottom of the hour. You know what I would do, Jason? I'd watch it again, mm -hmm. the whole thing. I mean, it was mesmerizing. And throughout my years as an elementary school well, junior. Great. Right. And then all the way through high school, I can honestly tell you, Monday through Friday, every afternoon at 3 o'clock with the 9 o'clock replay, I watched a show called Sports Look or Up Close with Roy Firestone. I learned how to interview people just by watching him. I watched it every day. And I would say six or seven days a week, I watched Sports Center every day. I watched everything related to even Vic Braden's Playhouse. You had to be old to have watched that. I remember the USFL weekly shows. I would watch it. I mean, so you can make an argument that they were a monopoly, but the way they did sports was incredible. They actually, to me, revolutionized the way you covered it. They're called football coverage, in my view, in the mid to late 80s, the way it just evolved. They turned every game into an event because that's all they basically had for a while. Boxing, the live remotes after big fights. So, yeah, they were a monopoly, but I thought they were great because they were a part of my life every single day. And now it's at a point, Jason, I only watch the live events mm -hmm. uh, and college football live, but I don't even watch college game day anymore. I don't. And were they a monopoly because they were the only ones interested in doing it at that time? Because people weren't covering sports on such a large scale. TJ, there was one other out option you had. It was called CNN Sports Night with the late, great Nick Charles and Fred Hickman. And they were actually like the Coke and Pepsi. Mm -hmm. But ESPN became such a major force that even CNN had to shutter its sports division after a while. So... <laughs> When ESPN was getting into their rise, I think I was in the third and fourth grade, and I remember watching SportsCenter with Stuart Scott mm -hmm. and Dan Patrick and Rich Eyes and the rest of that crew, and I would watch it. I, I would wake up on Monday morning, I think it would start at 7, at 6, 7 a.m., and I'd watch it five times until they went to the noon show. Just because back then you could only see highlights once. So I'd have to wait an hour to go see the, the Rams football highlights. And they, they made sports more fun. Watching Chris Berman, he used to have his... Uh, the nickname. Stumbling, stumbling. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, that. And then uh, Marshall Falk was a star at the time, so he'd say, Marshall, 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 Marshall yeah. right? Yep. And so they made it really fun. And what, what's interesting is during that time, right, we had outside the lines where you mm -hmm. would talk outside of the normal sports line. Now outside the lines is all you talk about. There is no inside the lines with sports. And a question for you, Jason... If we had stayed with that model, which we're all sort of begging for right now, just stay out of it, would you have become that relevant? Because you are, the, the reason you're so relevant and interesting is because you don't talk about sports like everybody else. You talk about the social issues. So what you, you give a more interesting spin and certainly a much more rational spin than Ryan Clark and these losers, but we talk social issues and you talk social issues when you were on PTI, when you're on Speak for Yourself and everywhere else. And that's sort of how you made your career. Being more interesting in social issues. Yeah, and so I, 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 it would, yes, and so I would have more of a monopoly on that lane, and I would be as successful. But also, it's like I actually put work and research, and and now, and again, I'll, I don't want to sound like Dion, but I'll never get credit for. It, but all of these people are just mimicking me. It, it, the Bomani Jones, Jamel Hill. All these guys looked at what I was doing and said, oh, I, I can do that. But they didn't put the work in, they're not objective, they're not fair, they didn't put the research in, they didn't have the life experience, they don't know what they're talking about. Because again, people think like, oh, uh, because you have dark skin, you're an expert on race and culture. It's just not true. Uh, but, but everybody kind of falls for that. I, wa the, the, I apologize for this, because it's really not I apologize for the arrogance of this, but it's just factual. I can remember the, the first, I think yeah, it was the first time I left ESPN. I think it was the first time. They ended up hiring like five or six different people trying to replace what I brought to them. One of them was the, the USC professor, Todd. Boyd. Todd Boyd. He's one of those talking heads on a lot of those documentaries. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 they kept trying to replace what I brought to the table. And they, it's ended up, it's part of the reason they hired and promoted Jamel Hill. And I can't remember if it was first, second time, but, but they used Boban. 
at one time I had the list of like, cause they kind of just like took me for granted. I was like, no nah, man, I do something unique and went someplace else. It was after the first time. And literally they tried to get five or six different people to do what I could do and they can't do it as well. And so now what we've left with is a bunch of really bad imitators do, talking about things they don't know anything about and they get all their talking points from Twitter. But yeah, I think I would, I would be as successful. Jason. I don't think it's just a bad imitation. They don't have the guts to go against the grain. And I don't know if you're at ESPN at that point, but uh, TJ, you, you've got to read his 2007 NBA All-Star column from Las Vegas. <laughs> his famous line was, this was Freak Nick on steroids. <laughs> and, 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 and he's like Luther Campbell. He's like banned in the USA. I've looked for the complete version of that article. And you have to get, like, cached versions. It's mm. almost like they don't want you to see it. Sure. That's the Kansas City Star that yeah. hit it, not ESPN. Yeah, and I remember reading that going, right now, that, sh that should be an NFT. Yes. Would, I, I'm just, I, I remember reading that one time, uh, and the problem is if anyone of Jason's skin tone wrote that, first of all, they wouldn't be allowed to. They would get roasted. They wouldn't have the guts or the integrity to say, this is what I saw. Because that was an ugly weekend from the NBA. And what's really funny is when you, when you Google that article, Jason, the guys that are the most outraged, it never fails. It's the white liberal guy. Mm -hmm. It's the white liberal that's always like taking the most umbrage at this, I thought, incredibly blunt article. And you know, that was part of because I worked at the Kansas City Star and ESPN at the same time. And so that article, the original, would have never gotten published at ESPN because they would have been too afraid of the NBA and David Stern. Kansas City Star doesn't have the NBA. They had paid for me to go out to NBA All-Star Weekend, or I, I can't remember who paid, because I was out. But, but anyway, I got the original article published in the Kansas City Star, and that drove everybody else to have to address what they actually saw. Yeah. Everybody was included, and I like Bill Simmons. Every, they were all trying to avoid it. They were all, nobody was going to touch it and pretend like it didn't happen. And then once I wrote about it, Bill Simmons and other people followed in. So I wasn't going to do it, but yeah, this was crazy. And, and David Stern hated my guts for the you know, rest of his time on Earth because of that article. Uh, but mm -hmm. but it, 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 and again, my whole mentality from the moment I graduated Ball State was like, I don't care about the athletes and the executives. I'm only going to worry about what the fans mm -hmm. think. And it was a numbers game for me that, you know, you'd have 500,000 readers of the Kansas City Star, or do you put out an article for them, or do you put it out for the 53 guys on the Chiefs team? I was like, well, the masses serve the 500,000. But Jason. So, wait, wait. so, Jason, so to that point, DLM, Data Lives Matter. What I mean by that is, when you go and compete online, there are thousands of channels that report on sports, but with people who are building up their brand and are separate from entities where they have to be controlled. So when people say, you know what, when I watch TV and there's all these commercials, it's a controlled narrative. I want to get something unfiltered. I want to get something authentic and raw and real. They go to YouTube. So that's the reason why Stephen A is on YouTube now, because he sees all, there, Jason, since the pandemic, there are at least 100 channels that I've seen go from zero to 100,000 that report on sports. And they sp maybe spend two minutes on the ESPN clip, and the other 40 minutes are them talking with their own ideas and thoughts. The problem is that ESPN has to compete across a wide spectrum now. The internet has opened it up. And now that it's no longer a monopoly, people can choose to subscribe here. I've been a YouTube Red subscriber for over a decade. Jamar, I picked, I'm right with you. Right? I actually spend a lot of nights on my favorite YouTube channels. Yes. And I've talked about the content creators. And in fact, in terms of the habits of the way we watch football, me specifically, you can actually now stream the games. I'm not going to say how. I'm not going to say it's always legal, but you can do it. Hmm. Second of all, if you miss a game, and I don't want to name these channels because, quite frankly, I don't want them taken down. They do me a great service. They actually cut up the games, Jason, where it's no commercial, no <laughs> fluff. You can watch a full game in 43 minutes. Boom. So I did Boom. yesterday. Like last Friday, I had to go to a Barney's Beanery because they have a Miami Hurricane game watch. It was on ACC Network, so I had to watch it there. But I wanted to get all the other stuff. I wanted to watch the place closely. Came home, and some guy had a 45-minute thing the whole game, but with everything, just the, not even the huddles. 
So a play happens for five yards, within a second you're getting the next play. They do that for all the games. Yep. And YouTube in itself is just a, that's the fifth network that no one talks yes. about. And and from a strategic standpoint, if you're a big advertiser and you're looking at paying these big networks or getting directly to your consumer, directly to them on the channels that they watch, the age demographic, all of that data matters. They can be very specific with their ad spend and spend a fraction of that, and that's where the money's going. Boxing has gone through the, uh, an issue with the pay-per-view that a lot of fans don't want to pay for mediocre fights. And as the pay-per-view prices have risen somehow for some reason, even though they're playing to a smaller audience, I have a theory, and I've said this for about 12 years, more people are watching boxing, less are paying it than ever. Yep. Because there's more streams in the delta of the Mississippi River. I've talked to people that have watched the last 500 pay-per-view bouts. They've never paid for a dime. I don't know how you stop it, to be honest with you, illegal streams. You can't. Okay. There's one other aspect of this I want to talk about, and I, and I hope that we're qualified to have somewhat decent takes on this. But, again, when I think about the demise, the fall of ESPN and, and what impact it could have on our American professional sports leagues and, and why the athletes – have been instructed to be so loyal to China. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it's because I think their agents and their handlers have told them, eventually, that's who may be able to foot the bill for, for your lifestyle and money moving forward, that this thing could fall apart here in America if ESPN and this whole thing, and because again, we got capitalism here and we got freedom of choice here, that it, it's actually these authoritarian governments, China, Saudi Arabia, that actually can control things. And, you know, China's got the China Broadcasting Network or whatever that can pay these ridiculous astronomicals for your type of entertainment. And so when I think about the, the downside of the fall of ESPN is I do think it's going to make American sports leagues and athletes more vulnerable to overseas influence. We've looked at what Saudi Arabia yep. tried with the PGA yep. Tour. Uh, we looked, Giannis cracking a joke about, hey, I had 500 million from Saudi Arabia. Charles Barkley almost left TNT to, to get some big check from the Saudi Golf League. Mm -hmm. That, it, it's, we're sitting here celebrating because we don't like ESPN and there's very good reason. But I do think American sports will be more vulnerable to foreign influence. And, and, and maybe that'll be a good thing because it'll bring everything out of the closet and, and LeBron can no longer pretend like, I'm doing this because I want a better America. No, nah, man, you're doing this and saying this and standing for these things because you serve China. We're all seeing it with Liv. I'm seeing it more and more with boxing. Some of your bigger events are now being funded by different groups in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. So. This is going to be interesting. I wonder if there's going to be a conglomerate that's going to buy a league just like they did golf. Um, I, I think one of the issues that the athletes have is they're not very intelligent. There used to be a point in time where you, you produce guys like Bill Bradley, Arthur Ashe. So they were more worldly. They were m much more intelligent in terms of what they said about the American status, culturally, politically. Now you're taking guys who never really, <laughs> they're kind of passed through the high school system. But, but here, what they've done, Steve, though, because you're right, but they're paying people to be smart for them. No, there's no doubt. And so they had, I think their advisors are letting them know, hey, this is the way the wind's blowing. It's blowing the direction of these foreign countries. And so well, it, it, it's not their lack of intelligence that bothers me. It's their lack of loyalty. Well, they're not... That may be a cultural thing in America, but when I see James Harden going to China and then he throws his GM under the bus, I, you know, look, he's there with the friendly audience. He's there to sell some shoes to a bunch of crouching tigers. I don't think he even understands the geopolitical ramifications of what's going on. He knows the audience he's talking to, though. He, he does, right. A bunch he's of pandering to China because... He, he knows right. that no, no, there's no. money to be made. Yeah, right, but he doesn't understand the geopolitical ramifications of what's going on. That's exactly the point. And mm -hmm. uh, th so you, what you can't do is farm out your own uh, 
sensibilities, your own loyalty and all that. You can pay somebody to say, make me as much money as possible and give me decisions. That's all they care about. Which is all they're doing. But it's, and this is the point, is the old athletes didn't do that. The old athletes, it, look, you need to figure out how much money you can make as long as it aligns with your values and your loyalties within your country. But when you just say, you make all my decisions for me and I'll just be brainless and do this, then that's how we end up here. I'm gonna defend them. They've been sold. The, the, the lie that there's value in being a global citizen. Nationalism is horrible. You're racist if you're nationalist. Mm -hmm. We're all global citizens. We are the world. We are the children. We, we, Barack Obama is a global citizen. He, he, he would say that. And he's, he's the golden child. Everybody should aspire to be Barack Obama and find their big mic. Everybody, should, that's the goal. They don't buy it though, or else they'd say, hey, those kids you have in China making those shoes for a quarter a day, you should do something about that. How about even, how about even closer to home? If you look at all the fentanyl deaths here in America, where is that fentanyl coming from? Mexico. But China. China as well. China, man, China man, manufactures it. Yeah. So if they had any real allegiance to the people that they entertain. I got, got it, but my point is, they're being told not to. We have a... But we're not taking care of the global citizens either, is my point. Like, well, they're at least, they, all they care about is taking care of themselves. The bag is all they're concerned and, with. And so, uh, we have a regime in charge. We have no border here in America. That's right. And so, if we have no border, all the messaging is, Whitlock and these, they're old fuddy-duddies, they believe in borders. They're racist, they're nationalists, they think that George Washington and Thomas Jefferson are great people. That's the old way of thinking, that needs to die. There are no borders, there's only the bag. And, and wherever you, if you can get it from Saudi Arabia, mm -hmm. if you can get it from China, that's all that matters. It goes to Steve's point though, because that means they are really stupid. Yeah, well, the other thing is, you're saying that they're being influenced. I think That's they're being, not new. I think they're being forced fed. <laughs> Didn't we have a baseball player that basically made a comment like, hey, there's only two genders, and he was forced to... Yes, backtrack uh, and yeah, apologize. So every athlete that goes through that situation, what I find alarming is that there's nobody in the mainstream media, especially at ESPN, that says, you know what, I agree with that guy. I actually don't mind if ESPN personalities really feel like that guy's a misogynist, he's a racist, but at least that network should have certain, certain dissenting voices that say, you know what, that athlete has a right to feel the way he does, and I'm with him. The problem is that when it's 100% in one direction and everything becomes anti-free speech, for lack of a better term, when you shut off that valve, that spigot to ESPN, this is why most people are now actually much more apathetic towards ESPN not being available than they would have been, let's say, 20 years ago. Well, so I, I just wonder... It's, uh, you were just, we were talking about this on air before this. In, in Japan, you're only allowed to have how many green cards? Well, I heard, I've read stats, they only, they allow less than a thousand people to immigrate. Oh, and then on sports teams, like, it's gotta be- Either, you get two gaijing. Okay, so at some point, like, every other country is allowed to say, hey, it's about us, except right. for America, we can't say it's about us, but I wonder if the average American citizen still does believe it's about us. And I wonder if you go global, <laughs> if there go your fans. Because it's still the United States, it's a, there's no question that's going to happen, TJ. But LeBron and these athletes, they don't care. Is the, is the check going to hit my direct deposit? That's all they care about. If my fans are over in China, mm -hmm. if they're over in Mexico, if they're over in Saudi Arabia, they don't care. Did, did, did the check hit my direct deposit? They'll play in empty COVID arenas. Yes. The bag. The bubble. Yeah, yes. the bubble. That's, that's the future. Okay, but so the money dries up at some point if... China's funding what? It's like you got a couple stadiums over there, you're playing in the United States where the people don't, like we're saying the money's endless and it's just gonna come from these foreign countries. For what? There's gotta be an end game. There's not just endless money all over the world that's gonna keep funding the NBA for no reason. Well, uh, China and Saudi Arabia will spend the money because of the great influence it has over American culture. If we're not watching, they're what in, influence? They're in a, well, that's my point, right? Eventually, it all dries up if the American people are no longer interested. And I think they think they will overtake us by the time that happens. They will have accomplished their goals. By the time we quit watching, 
Will uh, Xi Ping will be our president? Well, it may be happening a lot faster than that because what we're saying is ESPN is, how many people are actually listening to LeBron James spout off about his nonsense? Like what sort of, again, he couldn't get, he could, in his home state, he couldn't get Hillary Clinton elected. How much influence does this guy <laughs> actually have? Donald Trump, back when Ohio was actually a swing state before he went red, Donald Trump won Ohio. And LeBron said, don't ever do it. This here's, guy's a Here's the influence he has. Can't get people elected, but can he be a part of creating a mentality and a mindset that is so hostile to law enforcement that you can no longer police your major urban areas. And, and that is where we're at right now. The police are afraid. Citizens have been told to hate the police. And, and the best, the most patriotic thing you can do is fight the police and not comply. He has justified and contributed to a mindset that will lead, when there, when there is no law and order, the, the, the society is going to collapse. And, and so he, he's, he's had that level of influence and every, every, he and Colin Kaepernick and all their little followers and Pied Pipers, they've normalized a, a level of hatred towards law enforcement and toward our values. He's contributed to, again, this is why all these people are sitting around thinking they're so much smarter than, and better. Not just smarter, but just superior human beings to our founding fathers. It's a joke. Yeah, and Jason, the fact that ESPN willingly acts as a megaphone for those figures, there's a lot of people saying, good, now we've shut off the megaphone. Mm -hmm. that, that's the truth. And what's interesting about what he said there, I, you're right, there's a lot of uh, channels out there that'll take a two-minute ESPN clip and they'll react to it for 45 minutes. And if you want your dissenting voices, they're actually on YouTube. I mean, that's the interesting thing. Like, in a public space or a forum or a network like ESPN, Everything, especially if you are black, is going to have to be pro Dion. Like there's a pressure, that there's an agenda, that you must support, support Coach Prime. If you actually go on YouTube, there's a lot of YouTube creators. They are actually very wary. They're actually more aligned with you, Jason. Well, Steve, that's a good segue into what we're going to talk that's about. That's what I do. So that's, <laughs> that's what I do. Very good. I, I, I got it. Well, it's your show. <laughs> I do. It, it's your show. I'm like John Stockton. <laughs> you, you're you're high Steve Kim, no, no, I think you're more Carl Malone and John Stockton. I think you're... You know what? I was trying to be modest, and you're right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I'm... What was it? Frank... La I think I'm Frank Layden. You no, know, you're like, more like Antoine Carr, or Byron Russell, or somebody. <laughs> Frank Layden was the fat coach. I don't want to call you Mark Eaton. You're not tall enough, so... Okay. <laughs> All right, uh, let me tell you guys about uh, Liver Health Formula. You guys know I've been taking this stuff for two years, long before they hopped on board as a sponsor uh, for this show. Uh, the American Heart Association says that, like, you're three times, three and a half times more likely to have heart failure if you suffer from a fatty liver. The American Liver Foundation says that 100 million Americans have fatty liver, which means many people are at risk. We throw everything at our livers, cholesterol, alcohol, toxins, Tylenol, cigarettes. That's why so many of us have a sluggish, fatty liver that makes us gain weight and lose energy. For decades now, your liver helped you with over five, 500 key functions every day. It's time you help your liver. There's a solution, Liver Health Formula, an all-natural supplement which contains 12 clinically proven botanicals that help recharge and protect your liver manufactured right here in the US of A and approved by American doctors. So if you're looking to ignite your fat burning metabolism, boost your energy and transform how you look and feel, try liver health formula and receive a free bottle of blood sugar formula to reduce sugar cravings when you order today. Try liver health formula by going to getliverhelp.com slash Jason and claim your free bonus gift. That's getliverhelp.com slash Jason. Uh, don't go anywhere. Uh, we'll be back with some Deion Sanders conversation. It's my obligation on hate discrimination, raising up your hands for freedom. I don't believe in affirmative action. I believe in throwing people into the ocean and making them learn to swim. That's what happened to me. I, 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 that's, I'm, and I, I pardon the arrogance, I'm the best sports writer of the last 30 years. And it's not because anybody did any favors for me. I was thrown into the ocean 
at $5, graduate from college, first person in my family to graduate from college. I had to take a $5 an hour job because when I graduated from college, I wasn't as prepared as my peers. I played football, I drank beer, I socialized. I didn't do the internships, I wasn't as prepared. I had to take a $5 an hour job at the Bloomington Herald Times and had to play catch up. No one did me any favors. No one gave me uh, some, oh, your affirmative action, you don't have to learn how to write as well as everybody else. I got thrown in the ocean and I learned how to swim. Th that's what men do. Welcome back. Uh, it's already uh, wild in here, but it's about to get a little wilder. We're going to roll out to Los Angeles and bring in uh, Steve Kim's favorite person, uh, his favorite <laughs> chef, his favorite bartender, his favorite sports bar, uh, Coach JB from Last Chance U, uh, Jason Brown joining us. Jason, uh, welcome back to the show. Uh, we're talking a little uh, Deion Sanders, JB. Uh, you, you were kind enough to hop on our Twitter spaces last night for a brief time, then you bounced out. Uh, I still haven't had any of your cooking, and, and you know Steve's raving about it. But it, it, we'll, 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 let me talk about Deion Sanders. I just read an NBC Sports story that said, oh, God, NFL teams should be clamoring for Deion Sanders. <laughs> and I'm just like, one game? One game? And he all, and, and I understand. Oh, and the people are like, well, what about Jackson State? I'm like, come on, man. We're talking about one game here at a Power Five level, and he should already be an NFL head coach. Uh, any chance here, uh, JB, that uh, Deion Sanders becomes America's next one hit wonder? Uh, how, how's this season, how's the rest of this thing going to play out for Dion at Colorado? Uh, man, it's interesting. I talked about that this morning with Big Smitty. We got into an argument about it. Uh, here's the deal. Here's what I got two sides of this. I think Dion Sanders can absolutely destroy Matt Rule, Luke Fickle, and these guys – because I don't know if they're ready to play ball in the same way that um, Dion's going to. Replace your roster, NIL money, go out, use social media to get kids to come to your school. I don't know if these other guys are willing to do it. So I think Dion, with the swagged out gold chain, social media wonder that he is, can literally blow these guys out the water. Wisconsin looked horrific. Luke Fickle should have stayed in Cincinnati. Matt Rule looked horrific at Nebraska. And Dion, it's, 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 uh, it's prime time to be Dion Sanders right now in college football. And I'm wondering if Matt Rule entered this thing at the wrong time. And that's the devil's advocate side. On the other side, we have a complete mockery of anointing guys after they've done one thing seemingly overnight. We got to pump our brakes and understand when you're good, you tell everybody. When you're great, they tell you. We haven't told Dion he's great yet. The mainstream media has, but the coaching profession has not. Let's pump our brakes. They beat a horrible TCU team. And this is not the team that got waxed by 60 to Georgia. This is a team that lost a lot of starters. So, come on, man. We got to see if this thing is real first. And the Pac-12 is the best conference in college football this year from top to bottom, hands down. You just saw the SEC get waxed by a bunch of nobodies. And the Pac-12 is undefeated right now in play. Un uh, un unpack that. Give me some – give me – Steve or somebody help me understand that because I, I don't follow it that close. The Pac-12 yes. is the best conference in over the SEC. They are going out with a bang. They, they have I don't the, even know who's in the Pac-12. Well, there's only four of them now. But, yeah, I'm just telling you, the, 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 the remaining teams right now, 
this season, if you look at their quarterback rooms. Give me the team, seriously. Washington is solid with Michael Penix. USC has Caleb Williams. Oregon State's a sleeper with DJU. Arizona's on the rise. I like their coach, Jed Fish. He does a hell of a job out there. You take a look. Stanford and Cal have new coaching. They're running some exciting new offenses, which they haven't done in the past. Uh, Oregon with Bo Nix. Dan Lanning has that. They have a chance. And here's the problem. And Coach told me about this a month and a half ago. We went through the schedule. They might actually knock each other off, but that is the most balanced conference in America. I agree. And what happened to the SEC? Did, I don't uh, remember Georgia region. and Alabama. What, what was rough yeah. about it? So, so well, two LSU teams. LSU lost to Florida State on national television and got hammered. In South the Carolina got hammered by North Carolina. Yeah, it wasn't a great weekend for the SEC. That wasn't North Carolina that got beat South Carolina. That was someone yeah. worse than that. Oh, no, North Drake, Carolina beat them. North Carolina waxed them. Yeah. Pretty good. But, Coach, take over. Go ahead. You're the <laughs> football ahead. guy here. Go ahead. Listen to this. Are we judging conferences by the top four teams or the bottom four teams? I judge them by the bottom four. The Pac-12's bottom half is much better than the SEC's bottom half, and it's been that way for a long time, but the SEC happens to have the national champion come out of it in the last few years, so everybody thinks the SEC top to bottom is mm -hmm. unbelievable. The Pac-12 is going to knock each other off this year. The SEC is going to have three or four really good teams, and they're going to wax the rest of the SEC. Florida may not win an SEC football game this year. That's how bad they are. By the way, you forgot to mention Utah, Steve, which may be a playoff team. Uh. Washington Utah. State, Washington State is a sleeper. Tempo, good QB. They have a lot of upside in Washington State that no one's going to talk about. The Pac-12 is going out with a bang, like Steve said. And I'm just telling you, it's going to be a shame that we're losing them on the West Coast to all the original OG West Coast football guys like Steve Kim and I. We're going to miss the Pac-12, and it's going to be San Jose, Fresno, and San Diego State now, which is a complete mockery. So it's going to be – By the way, gonna, Jason uh, – UCLA has a young quarterback by the name of Dante Moore who can be a star. And, and after three passes, I said, man, he's overrated. And you should have seen JB's face. It's like he had, it's had an impact on me. But he's going to be another star. I think he's got a higher upside than Dorian Thompson-Robinson. So if you look at quarterback play and week to week, who gives you a tough game? This is where the SEC is overrated. A lot of their teams do not play each other. Jason, Alabama and Georgia play each other once every six years. And another thing, I'm sick of the ninth-place SEC team chanting SEC because some other team wins the title. I, I wasn't chanting ACC when Florida State dusted LSU. It doesn't work that way, guys. So I well, Hold on. Let me, let me defend this for a second. I pl <clears throat> having played in both, yeah. the Big 12 cares nothing about other Big 12 teams. It was an all-every-man-for-himself yeah. culture. The SEC's culture cares about the success of one another. It's very weird. I don't actually even like it very much. Justin Cousins, huh? It's a strange, I'm just telling you, there is a weird, when you, when you go, there's a, there's, the fan support is different than it is in the Big 12. It's one thing to go to Oklahoma. We went there, you get hammered. The same thing with Texas A&M, where we went to is 100 some thousand. But most of the, the Big 12, every man for himself, the SEC doesn't operate that way. Mm. Hey, can I, can I chime in on that reason why that is? I agree with you. You can do whatever I you want, JP. I can't. <laughs> It's not like we hey, can control I, you. I, agree with um, I do agree with TJ, but there's a, I don't agree with the fact, the reason why. The SEC doesn't tell on each other. The Big 12 does. That is why. Mm. Greg Sankey mm. has I a good that. old boy work there that's all about money, and they're not going to snitch on each other. Nick Saban went in there and laid that down years ago when he was at LSU, and then he went to Alabama and did the same thing, and that thing follows Nick Saban's control and leadership, and the SEC knows that Greg Sankey will probably be the commissioner of college football very soon when the NCAA is abolished by the SEC and the SEC goes on its own, which is going to happen, and they are going to be under the tutelage of Greg Sankey and the SEC. That is why. They don't tell on each other. They are the biggest cheating let me in the last as an Auburn record. Tiger I can attest no well hold on I want to add something because I think you're half right JB I think you're absolutely right about the top tier and this is this is based on discussions that I've had with former coaches and different people around the SEC when I was a little more involved Auburn doesn't get told on Alabama doesn't get told on Georgia Florida you better believe Vanderbilt and Missouri and Mississippi State and the bottom tier, we don't get to pull the same stuff that Georgia does. It was a miracle 
that Missouri got Kelly Bryant over Auburn. An absolute miracle because you don't want to know what Auburn was offering to him to, him to play football there before you were allowed it, to offer him anything. And Missouri couldn't uh, offer him anything because everybody knew. It was Kelly Bryant's coach, Juco coach, got him to Missouri, who was at Hutchison Community College. I, I know the whole deal. It's not a miracle. He, he wanted to play for the coach. Uh, monetarily, you know it was a miracle. Nobody cares on Vanderbilt because Vanderbilt's horrific. Nobody cares. <laughs> so that is why I, it's a difference, in my opinion. There's a difference. The bottom half of the Pac-12 can go into the SEC any year, any time, in my opinion, and dominate. I think they could be Kentucky, Vanderbilt, uh, Florida, um, all these teams that are mid, as, as the young kids call mid now, I think can dominate them. Um, and I think this year is the best Pac-12 has been in a long time. Um, all right. you, you, you've hijacked the conversation. Let me, that's let me, my job to do let that. Let me get it back on track. I, I brought you terrible. on to talk about Deion Sanders <laughs> as a, as a one-hit wonder. Now, I kind of like the way you unpacked it. Like, there's a chance this could work because some of these coaches aren't willing to do what Dion's willing to do. They're not going to turn their lives over to social media. They're not going to live in the transfer portal the way Dion is. They actually, again, the, he's going the Bobby Bowden approach, and there's some of these coaches that actually like to coach. They don't, they don't just want to be the head coach. They actually want to mess with the game plan and strategize and all that. And so they have a different mentality, and that that's part of – the disruption I was talking about yesterday is that, that they are legitimately concerned about that Dion could change the entire dynamics of a head coach, take you out of the meeting rooms and put you on television screens and digital screens and make it all about your personality and not what you bring to the game X's and O's wise. And, and that's not a skin color deal. That's a, man, if, if Dion becomes the model and just former great players come in and get to be head coach and they really don't have to coach anything, they just have to be big personalities, I don't blame guys for being like, you know, like, hey, man, th this is annoying to me, not because of skin color. It would be like someone coming into sports writing and, and, and making it like, oh, you don't have to be a sports writer, be a talk show host. That's more important. I'd be bothered by that. You, you, I, I got, so it's the got, disruption that Dion represents. But go ahead. I got an interesting take, though. I talked about it today, and I argue with Smitty. There are a thousand Dion's out there, and I include myself in the thousand that I know personally. I know coaches out here right now that are not getting a shot at coaching because of either a a depiction that we have about us. Be a personality that administrators are scared of, which is called alpha males, and mm. because we're not in an alpha male society anymore, and C, we're scared of hiring someone that is going to go against the grain, and it actually ends up working, Jason. Do you know how many white coaches in America right now, and I can just tell you because I got off the phone with a few, that are scared of Deion Sanders succeeding? Because it is over. It is over. I hate to say this and use this race card thing. The white coaches right now are scared as hell that this guy succeeds right now at Colorado, by the way. Not at Georgia, Florida State, or Florida. He's in a predominantly, we consider, a white, rough area of the, war, of the country. Um, you're going to say, whoa, uh oh this guy's got it figured out. We're screwed. Because... Who is going to fly past Boulder, Colorado to go to Wisconsin from the south? Who's going to go to Nebraska if Dion and Matt Rule walks into a Florida kid's home a front room? Who's going to go to any of these schools over picking Dion? Nobody. They're in trouble. And they better figure it out real quick because, in my opinion, there's only a few coaches that are going to be able to sustain this. And it's the guy at Duke. It's the guy at Missouri. I mean, at Texas State. It's the guy at um, like Dion, of course. There's not a lot of coaches that are sustainable right now. They're going to get murdered by this man in recruiting. And that is our blood life mm. in this profession, recruiting. So I'm just telling uh, you. Whoa, 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 whoa. 
the bag determines recruiting right now, JB, mm-hmm. not not the coach. And, and so, uh, I don't you know. know. I don't know about that. You, you don't think Alabama and these SEC schools can pay what Dion and Colorado are playing? They can. They can pay. But if I'm Dion, so, I go into the home and say, hey, that guy Nick Saban with that duck on the commercial, I'm on that same commercial with him. And I can pay you too. And I'm Deion Sanders. I'm more relevant right now to these black kids in the rural, in the in the in the hoods of America that struggle academically, who personally, guys like myself and Dion go after are more amped to go play for Dion right now if this thing goes south and blows up than they would be to go to Nick Saban. I'm just telling you right now, it's out there, it's okay, in the but- air, hearing it every day. This is a real problem for college football coaches, and people need to start listening. This could be a problem for big-time blue bloods. I'm telling you right now. Now, to your point, yeah. the wonder thing could very well be. I don't want to hear Deion Sanders as an NFL coach. He is not a coach. He is a CEO of a brand. He is a brand mm-hmm. ambassador that understands how to control it, manage it, and lead it. He has full buy-in from his team, which is which. the only reason he has that, Jason, is because the University of Colorado and their athletic director is given it. Prime time, full autonomy. And you have to have full autonomy to succeed in today's society with kids. If you do not and you're hamstrung by admin, you will be, you will perish. And I'm just telling you right now, the schools that fire coaches year in and year out because they don't have full autonomy – and they're getting beat in recruiting. And when Dion took the job, he said, I want full autonomy or I'm not coming. That is why they're the only school that allowed it and did it. And that's why I hope Dion is good for college football in this regard. He's opening up a new rabbit hole, wormhole, portal, whatever you will say, for other coaches like myself and these thousand that I mentioned that also can do the same job Dion's doing. You just don't know because admin is scared to hire us. Mm. Hopefully, well, Dion something brings in for that JB. And that, and that <laughs> well, <laughs> well, I'll just say this. The University of Steve, he, he, he'd get an interview. Yeah, absolutely. I'd be like, JB, can you keep us off probation? Yes. Would you run the score up? Yes. Hired. But I, I will say this. There are white coaches, there's black coaches, and then there's Dion. Mm-hmm. I think Dion is such a transcendent figure. That's right. Who had spent 20 years being maybe the most famous cornerback ever. Then he had a television career. Like, Ray Lewis is an iconic football player. He does not have the personality of a Dion. Neither does Eddie George. Neither did Ed Reed. There's only one Dion. I just like, think about it. Yeah, Ray Rhodes is black. He ain't Dion. Remember Ray Rhodes? That's one of the most serious human beings ever. Like, I don't think that, to me, a lot of kids would say, you know what, let me just play for that milquetoast white guy. Ray Rhodes scares the hell out of me. I don't think it's just about the skin color with Dion. Dion is incredibly unique. I, I, I think that, and the other thing I want to throw back at JB, because JB's old enough to remember it, Kim, Steve, you are as well. There were, John Thompson, the basketball coach, mm. is one of my favorite figures of all time. He created a lot of opportunities for a lot of black coaches in college basketball when he brought Georgetown out of nowhere. He, he built that entire program. And the next thing you know, uh, Nolan Richardson's getting the job at Arkansas, and this guy, George Raveling, everybody started getting jobs because they wanted the next John Thompson. But here we are now, uh, 40 years later after that, and, and no one's replaced John Thompson. There hasn't been a next John Thompson. The, the, Nolan Richardson was the next closest thing. And I think he won two championships at Arkansas. One. One. He John played in Chaney. two. Yeah. John Chaney. Don John Chaney. Ch- John Chaney's another guy, part of that era. And, and got, guys started getting jobs because of John Thompson was a job creator. And I, I've celebrated that and said he doesn't get nearly enough credit. But college basketball is not dominated by black coaches uh, 40 years later. And, and so – you know, D- will Dion uh, usher in an era where uh, some guys with big personalities, whether white or black, may get some opportunities? Yes. Does it guarantee that they'll have success? No. 
So, so that's the dream that Dion is selling. But really what Dion is, is he's the number one hope dealer. Dion is like the Nino Brown of college football. His whole game is to build, he has a media company. I mean, he has YouTube channels going. His, all of his sons have their own media companies building up behind them. It's gonna take a, a huge machine to do it, to replicate what he's doing. And the reality is he knows most of the other coaches don't wanna do that kind of work. He's the chief marketing officer, he's yep. not a head coach. And so that's the other part of this where you're like, okay, so, so your head coach is now just going to be your, your head of marketing and then good luck. Like eventually this is gonna turn into Urban Meyer at Florida where it's, it, you're just the warden of a prison. Because if you, are, the head coach has to be the guy who passes down all of the consequences, who sets the tone for everything that's going on. And, and we're also acting like Dion can just show up and be Mr. Personality and he's gonna get everybody. And again, you, you point out the money thing. Missouri just pulled in the, the number two or three recruit in the country because Missouri legislature passed a law that said you can start paying the kids when they're still in high school. Mm. You don't even have to show up on, on campus yet. Just sign up, even if you don't make it there, we can start paying you. So they just pulled a six foot five, 260 pound defensive end to come play for him. That sort of stuff is gonna even the playing field. It's not gonna be so simple to say, hey, prime time's yeah. here, baby, come play and for him. there's still scholarship limits. There's still 85 is the limit. It's the old days of John McKay stacking up 10 All-American running backs, that's over. And, and Jamar makes a good point. Most coaches say, oh, we don't want the cameras around. That's why every year HBO and the NFL films have to pull teeth to do uh, uh, whatever they hard knocks. Yeah, or hard as knocks coach line. calls it now, soft knocks. <laughs> Dion's the one guy saying, oh, no, no, we're, we're hard yeah. knocks every day of the year. I don't know how many other coaches would really want to do that. JB, what happens next year in the year after, but next year in particular, Dion's going to have to hire a new offensive coordinator. That, that guy's going to get another head coaching job. And so, and if the defense ever shows any life, the defensive coordinator is going to get a job. And that those just, and, and so right now, yeah, Dion's got great coordinators, a great coaching staff, but people start picking at it, and you're left with the chief marketing officer who has to be able, because it ain't just the kids. You got to be able to poach the right coaches as well to coach up the kids. And that's going to be harder and harder and harder. I guarantee you, and I don't want to speculate about anybody, but I'm just a guarantee. You, not all the coaches are on board that are working for Dion. They're not all on board with what Dion's doing. They're on board with the opportunity that may arise from being a part of this, all this media of attention, know that they can get jobs and hey, I can just go here for a year or two and move on. But I'm not sure if all the top flight coaches are gonna be comfortable with the program Dion setting up. All right, to your John Thompson reference, we're in a beta male society. So guess who's a John Thompson guy? Patrick <laughs> Ewing. Guess who tried to take over and do what John Thompson did? Patrick Ewing. He got fired because he was cussing kids out left and right. We're, I don't know if we – it's not a black and white thing. It's an alpha male thing. I won't be hired again because admin is scared. They're scared of Patrick Ewing. They're scared of John Thompson. They're scared of me. And Dion is going to be that anomaly right now because of the – he don't cuss. He has a different approach. Um can he be the guy to change the culture as you stated? I don't know that because I don't believe admin's gonna hire a guy like my with my skin tone or with Dion's um, that has a abrasive personality. Having said that, um, this is Dion Sanders, Jason. To your point, I was gonna try to bring it up and you you brought it up for me. Mike Zimmer is sitting there as an analyst. He's one of the best defensive coordinators in NFL history. He's sitting there in Boulder with him right now. He has 25 NFL experience, head coach, OC, and DC sitting there waiting to come to Boulder to help him. He has an unlimited batch of resources in his Rolodex. I'm telling you, Nick Saban and everybody out there is on notice. They are scared of what could be in Boulder because this man has everything that everybody else wants. He has unlimited resources, he has a film crew, and he's not scared. Today, if you have if you seen his Instagram today, Jason, he is literally no. game planning Nebraska with his players, talking about how personal it is, and you're filming it live and posting it. He does not care about what Nebraska sees. 
where Steve's point is, we're not, don't film me. We're not putting this out there for bulletin board material. He's putting it out there for bulletin board material. It is because it's what it is. It's Netflix and JB. It's a controversial thing that sells. And that is what kids want to see these days. They, they see controversy. They're going to go to it because it's prime time Deion Sanders. And I'm telling you, it is going to scare a lot of folks. He has a lot of... Well, uh, JB, quick question. How does this play? Because right now they're on top of the world. They're 1-0. They've just won the national title in, uh, on Labor Day weekend. But let's say they hit a rough spat, uh, spot. Depth. Injuries, all of a sudden reality hits, and they're two and five. How does that play in the locker room, in your view? Um, with 80 guys that don't know each other, bad. And that's why we talked about the other day. <laughs> they can't lose, Steve. You got to win in this with this model. Because if you don't win with this model, it implodes really quickly, as we've seen all across America. So you have to win. This is an all-in thing. Dion's saying it's personal and attacking the media and all this and calling it a white and black thing and all that because he's saying I'm all in. Both feet are in. I'm not one foot in, one foot out. I am all in on this deal. And if he goes down, he's going to go down with a flame or he's going to go down as, as a guy that changed the game forever in the NIL era. So it, it, it's not really uh, – I can't go three and, and, three and nine, Steve, because you're going to really look bad right now. And then the model changes, Maybe, right? <clears throat> yeah. The, these 25, 30 NFL coaches are all waiting today to see what happens. They're not actually lined up to coach for Dion. The second something goes wrong, nobody wants to be a part of the circus. His downside is so much lower than the average coach's downside because it's on film. Yeah. There is no, hey, give me three to four years. We're going to build this thing. Let me implement my program. His program's here. It's on display for the whole world to see. And so you, you will be able to see inside the film room that Dion's not doing anything, that his other coach that just got hired to be head coach somewhere else now has left. And you got to re-recruit every single year and start over. I think his downside is, is lower than most any other coach. Isn't delegation a skill, though, of a CEO? Hell yeah, that's what I was about to say, Steve. you got to be able to do it, Steve. Nick Saban don't coach no more. He's the CEO. He oversees it. Dion did a hell of a job. We can't under we can't underplay and downplay the no, no, fact. No, 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 no. Hold on, hold on, JB. JB, you become a CEO after you implement your systems and other people come into it. You don't show up and say, you all come in and do your thing. I'll be over here marketing. Nick Saban coached for a very, very long time. These are Nick Saban systems that other people are running. This is Bill Belichick's system that other people are running. That's why it works, because it's his deal. When Dion says, come in here and run your thing, that's a totally different deal. You work up to CEO. You don't start at CEO and say, all right, delegate everything. But listen, though. Listen, TJ. It's not a, the Dion is an anomaly. There's only one primetime Dion Sanders coaching. See, Nick Saban had to start as a grunt. He had to start as a GA. He had to work up and earn his stripes in the coaching profession. Nick Saban wasn't the best NFL athlete of all time. Nobody knew who Nick Saban was. He married his wife at a, at a, at a, at a damn mobile gas station in the middle of West Virginia, and they <laughs> fell in love and became a coach. He wasn't Deion Sanders. Deion Sanders is a CEO already. He owns businesses, companies. He's a brand ambassador. He came in and I said, I think you're missing my point, though, JB. And TJ. My, my point is it has to be your system. It it's is It's not that system. Dion can't be separate. How, how is it? What is, what is the system? The system it's is Twitter. Now, complete buy-in by everybody involved. Or guess yeah. what? Let me ask you something, TJ. Do you think that... Coach Lewis Le or uh, Coach leaves Kent State as the head coach. Even uh, we get it; it's a bad school. You leave you leave as a head coach oh. to go be a coordinator <laughs> at a school that won one football game, the worst school in, in Power Five. And if you didn't buy into this guy, yeah, hold, hold for, I can answer that question. At Kent State as head coach, he might be making four fifty five hundred thousand. As OC at Colorado, he could be making as much as $2 million. Mm -hmm. That's why I say Dion is the hope dealer, because he's, he's selling riches even beyond the football field. He's connecting with people and saying, hey, listen, look, look at all these brand deals. If you get, if you get your Instagram to a million followers as a, as a college athlete, you can make hundreds of thousands of dollars a month and be a nobody. 
because social media is that powerful and Dion understands that tool. He's wielding it. Social media is social selling 24 seven. That's what he's selling to his people. He's like, we can hey, build can this I machine for guys, each of you. Can I tell you guys the coaching side of this real quick though, to Jason's point? It wasn't about money at all because guess what? If he left as a head coach and he risked, this is a risk first reward thing. I left a head coaching job and I went to a one in 11 program in Colorado. If we go 1-11 in at Colorado again, I'm fired and I do not have a job. But if I stay at Kent State as a head coach and get fired, I become a O coordinator at another school. This is a huge risk for Sean Lewis to leave Kent State. He's not doing it just no. for $2 million. He's doing no. it because totally, he leaves. Totally disagree. Totally di he, was, I don't. he wasn't even a flop at Kent State. So he, whatever happens at Colorado, there's only upside for Sean Lewis. Because if it goes poorly, Dion, he's a, he didn't know what he was doing. He created this circus, blah, blah. If it goes well, excuse me? Did you know who Sean Lewis was before he became the OC at Colorado? Yes, I, I played in the Mac. I'm the only guy that watches Mac football. Yeah, hey, coach, coach, <laughs> Dion's not swack, but Whitlock is Mac. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, come on. Hey, right hey, there hey, for that hey, fine hey, conference. Hey, Jeez. Hey, this may be the anomaly in knowing who Sean Lewis was before he became yeah, a Colorado. I know, but you asked me. Yeah, yeah. It's JB, it still goes back to the main point of like, Buy-in is not a strategy, right? You have to be able to go back to basics. When, when the rubber meets the road, you have to be able to go back to basics and say, this is who we are. This is what we're going to do. We've started from here. If we get out of line, we're going right back to here. Where is here for Dion? That's, that's my oh, point. That he's not started anywhere. There's no basis for anything. Well, TJ, I will say this. And again, maybe he's lying through his teeth, but I'll take him at face value. He recently did a 30-minute sit-down with Joe Klatt on Fox. I found it to be fascinating. I think Dion actually came off really well. And he actually talked about a story when he first got to Colorado. He had the meeting with the team or say, I'm bringing in my own Louie. And so the position groups broke up. And he said the linebacker room, they had a boom box and they were playing music. And he walked in there and goes, whoa, whoa, what's this? Said, well, coach, we'd like to have music. And he said, guys, I'm going to tell you this right now. Not here. Not here. You do that again, you might as well just walk out. He goes, don't, we're not doing that. So I don't think this is soul playing, playing out as a football program. He's actually running some discipline. Yep. That, in my view, as a football Steve, guy. Steve, I'm going to correct you. Oh, what? He's, also, he's presenting himself in an interview as if he's instilling mm. discipline. Hold and on. Maybe I got he is. Here, man. I he just be told you a story. I'm not scared to give you the insight on this because nobody has my insight. My best friend in the world's there. My best friend in the world is there every day, 20 hours a day. My best friend in this whole world is there coaching. Trust me, those guys are walking in a straight and narrow down a line, and it's nope. a it's a love, work hard, and get what you earn environment. And that's not easy to instill. And to TJ's point, it's not a – Running and controlling and creating your own like CEO, like TJ was saying, is a trait, in my opinion. It is a relationship-building trait, and it's not hard. You don't need to know about X's and O's, man. It's about Jimmy's and Joe's, and if you can get them to run through a wall for you, it'll cover up a lot of inept downfalls or you may have as a person, a human, or a head coach. He hired the right guys. They bought in. And now he has a complete buy-in. Let me ask you, TJ, how many kids you know right now would play at 107 degrees, 129 snaps, and not bitch and moan and, tr and try to act like they were going to cramp out and cry and go get pickle juice in them? How many right now? He has a guy in 2023 in the softest era of professional or, or athletics and, and college athletes to buy in and not tap out one time in Fort Worth, Texas in 170 years. Maybe there are kids across America that would do that. Let's not pretend that kids don't love football all of a sudden and they wouldn't want to go out when you're on national television in the biggest game of the year that everybody's watching. When you're, Everybody would do that, JB. What are you talking about? I don't know anybody that wouldn't do that. Everybody would do it. Show me, man. You got yes. the Kids tapping out who, every who, day. But, well, first of all, who's had the opportunity? One who has the talent. Two who's had the opportunity. Oh my there, there was God. never a time. I, 
I did not oh. play that long ago. I only came off the field when they said, hey, TJ, come on off the field. You're not good enough, okay? <laughs> Which happened a fair bit. Which happened a fair bit. But I'm just telling you, there's a lot of kids who are dying to play football and would like to stay out there. They just don't have that ability. Play football. There's a lot of kids that just want to be on camera and wear a jersey and show the girls they have a jersey on. There's a lot of kids that are faking the funk. By the way, half of Jackson State's team when Dion took the job didn't even know who Dion Sanders was. You think that's a guy that loves football? Come on, man. These kids don't even know who Bo Jackson is anymore. They don't even know who Dion was until he became. They Googled him and found that he wore a jerry curl and a gold necklace. And it said prime on it. And he wore 21 and had, had a jerry curl for the Atlanta Braves. I'm telling you, it's fact. The kids didn't even know There's who he was. There's a difference wanted. between knowing your NFL history and loving football. Just because you don't sit and watch NFL films, like these kids, mm. I'm telling you, you don't have to sit there and study NFL football to go As out and kid. love playing it. As a, a kid, kid, yeah. I, don't, I, I disagree. We didn't have social media, though. It's a little bit different. I know, but I mean, Steve, Steve uh, as a kid, you could hand me virtually any football card of any NFL player, and I could you recite for you yeah. what's on the back. This is why you're sitting here today. Most people are not. <laughs> me too. Most, most people. Me too, to be honest. People I'm Asian. Just, we didn't people, play football at all. You can love hey, playing hey, a sport hey, and hey, not know. You can not be able to yes. name all who won the Super Bowls in the early '90s. No, but Jason, let me ask you something. If a kid now is focused on his 1,440 minutes in a day or whatever it is that makes a day up. And 1,200 of them are on a phone, and the lack of and video games are the other a couple hundred minutes. Do you really think they're investing in their bodies, in their time to really go out here and say, "Oh man, no matter what, I'm going to learn this game. I'm going to I'm going to follow Steve Kim and be the encyclopedia Korean encyclopedia." No, they're not. They're not doing it. They don't care. <laughs> they could be YouTubers, TJ. They could be IG models and make millions of dollars. You think they really care? Ask Kyler Murray. <sighs> JB, oh, not everybody cares everything about making millions of dollars when you're a kid. I loved playing sports. The money came like when I grew Look, I got married and oh I had kids. I thought, you know, God. I better go make some money. People like playing sports. Like people oh like doing God. physical you, activities. You, I'm not people telling people you there's not kids who sit inside and on YouTube all day. You couldn't have paid me enough money to sit inside. I would play football for free instead of getting paid a hundred thousand dollars to be on YouTube all day. But TJ, it's very different though when you come from these impoverished situations. You are the savior for your family. You literally have to think about how many to get mom out the projects, how many to get my brothers and sisters, and if you are the talent, everyone is looking at you. That's what some of these kids are going through. Some of them. A lot of them. Well, the sure. best, the top athletes, that's well, what they're thinking. The ones you recruit, <laughs> they're in that. That's the truth. Yeah, the, the ones, ones that get you to a national title, they, they generally come, and this is going to be stereotypical Kim here, but they are from one-parent families. I've seen it in boxing. And Dion, and Dion, boxing is, that, and Dion is that father figure who is selling them the hope that I can change your life. If you listen to me, let me transform you. He's almost taking him through like a rite of passage, like I went through in the Marine Corps. He's taking him through that and saying, if you do what I say, the riches are on the other Man, side. that's what every head coach is. I, I understand, but from a- 100 years. Yes, but TJ, how many not of with have that a style. 15 minute highlight reel that's of punt returns though? That's, I got it, I'm, I mean, but, but I'm saying, okay, yeah. look. look. The, the average kid today, Dion is a nice shiny toy with absolutely zero resume of getting anybody the NFL. He did it himself, congratulations. Yeah. Nick Saban could say, which one of my 800 first rounders would you like to be? Do you mm -hmm. want to be on this list? This, this happens, Dion is, a, again, nice shiny toy, has proven that he can do a lot of good stuff for Dion Sanders. Well, coach, I want to ask you this. Obviously, this year, there was an influx of Louie. A lot of that Louie is going to stay, okay? They're going to be in the baggage carousel. How do you think, De does Dion just always bring in 35, 40, 50 new guys, or do you think there's going to be any stability within his program, or he'll just basically pluck blue chip all Americans out of high school? Well, first of all, first of all, the guy that, that's going to Missouri, if I was Dion, this is why they don't want me recruiting. I would tell the, the kid, hey, go, let Missouri pay you while you're in high school, and then transfer here, and I'll give you a bigger bag. That's what's happening mm. right now, so you know. <laughs> that's what's yeah. happening right now, so we're clear. People are leaving because the transfer portal is allowing them to leave. So Dion's creating an NFL environment at Colorado, I'm telling you for a fact, and nobody's safe there. But they all believe in him. So everybody wants to go to play for Dion now because they think he's the next Nick Saban and is going to get a guy where you could not get yourself, which is by definition coach. So if I believe I want to go to Dion, he's the NFL of college football. 
Don't you think it's going to be a pretty competitive area and you can't screw up? You're going to walk on pins and needles because he will cut you in a New York minute and bring in a new five-star blue chipper? That is what he's going to do. He's going to bring in 30 to 40 every year. I've seen it. I already know this plan of attack. And he's going to tell everybody else, go ahead and beat me. Go ahead and match me. Chaos, match my JB. It, it is. Chaos. JB, JB you, you, you've done a tremendous job. Uh, this is, you know, you had very good performances on here before. This is your best work. Uh, but I will say, this is my summation. There's something in this for JB, if, if Dion works. <laughs> it makes JB a viable candidate. Uh, JB's best friend is on the coaching staff. So I love the loyalty there. And, and, and JB, I'll get all of this tape over to Dion. And per <laughs> perhaps when Sean Lewis is a head coach someplace else, you can be the, head, you can be the OC at Colorado. Uh, Hey, you know they're not hiring me. They're too scared of me. I'm still too raw and uncut uh, for that. Well, I, I don't know. I'm not so sure. Uh, tell Smitty, uh, we said hello. Uh, great job, JB. Man, you you added some spice. See, you know what? You know what bothers me about you coming on the show though with Steve Kim. Steve Kim shows you 20 times more respect than he shows me. Mm. I mean, it's it's amazing. <laughs> Uh, how I, much, and I don't know how you got that out of him, but I can't I, get any of yeah. it. Hey, Steve, I feed him, and it's not just kimchi and Korean barbecue. Ah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> that tri-tip on Saturday was like Terrence Crawford pound for pound quality. Hold up, man. Come on. Hold up. What about that brisket you ate yesterday? That was the greatest brisket <laughs> ever. And not only that, his Palomas are unbelievable. Oh. Oh, the Palomas are incredible with the little squirt and all that other stuff we want to talk about. <laughs> got all, all, and by the way, right now, I need JB. He's the only way I can watch ESPN in California uh. <laughs> is at his house. So, so JB, right now, you are very important in my life. <laughs> he's, he's using JB like when you use your friend for, with the game console. Yeah. Right? Like, hey, Netflix password. You got two, you got two of them. Come on. So. I got to get out there. I got to see this house and I got to, I got to, yeah, I got to, I got to see this grill and all that. We're going to let JB go. But before, before we go, I want to talk about one hit wonders. Uh oh. Mm. And, and uh, is Deion Sanders going to crack uh, the list of one hit wonders? And so we've come up with two separate Mount Rushmore's of, one hit wonders. This is the ultimate Mount Rushmore, the one I'll talk about first. Uh, James Buster Douglas mm. knocked out Mike Tyson. Yes. He's definitely on the Mount Rushmore of, of one hit wonders. Vanilla Ice, Ice Ice Baby. Mm -hmm. uh, Andrew Dice Clay, Ooh. Uh, mm. oh, the comedian again. Mm -mm. And uh, Ronda Rousey, I consider her <sighs> one hit wonder. She won 12 fights okay. somehow was running around talking about she could beat Floyd Mayweather. <laughs> it's, it's, and she won 12 fights, and they acted like she was Muhammad Ali. Uh, so that's my Mount Rushmore of one-hit wonders. Could Dion uh, get on this list? Or what do you think of my... Okay, first of all, I, I, there's a, a couple I would have put in above that. Oh, go yeah, we got an these, honorable mention. Some, some of these actually had good runs. Like Rousey, for about two years, people actually thought she could she really. She fought win. twelve fights. She won twelve fights. That's Steve. a good run. That's a good run. That's a good run. Also, Andrew Dice Clay he was pretty funny. He, Andrew Dice Clay was great. You he make got, it sound like he had one joke. No, knock, no, knock. no. Come on. But he, he fell off a cliff, man. They can't, he's the first guy to ever get canceled, basically. Yeah, I know. Poor guy. All right. I'm with you on this, Steve, because I, I don't. His methodology here for one-hit wonders, I looked up Ronda Rousey. She was champion for 1,074 days. Yeah, I mean, come on. This girl was champion for three years. Now, Buster Douglas, he was the Andy Warhol champion, 15 minutes. Okay, I get it. Because the very next fight, he came in out of shape, got knocked out by Holyfield. When you're talking about a one-hit wonder, you're talking about, like, Tommy Two-Tone. 8675309. Great song. It's everyone, like, does karaoke. <laughs> Never had another song. Another one, The Diddy by The Paperboy. Remember, late 92, the hip-hop? He was like the black version of Tommy Two-Tone. He never had another song anyone heard of. Also, the greatest sports one-hit wonder that I could think of, in a Super Bowl, there was a running back by the name of Timmy Smith. Oh. He kept running the counter tray. had like 200 yards. The, yeah. the great story, Joe Gibbs comes up to him and says, hey, kid, George Rogers' hamstrings, not, you're starting 15 minutes before the game. And 
It's lost in the Doug Williams performance, which was great. But Timmy Smith literally may have not had 200 yards the rest of his life because he got cut a year or two later. So those are the ones that I would look at. Some of those other guys, like, by the way, Buster Douglas, people do not realize this. Prior to the Mike Tyson fight, he was actually a solid to decent heavyweight who had some good wins, except Mike Tyson was thought of as being unbeatable and therefore a 42-to-1 underdog. So I even think that classification is a slightly unfair to James Buster Douglas. One hand, you, you I, go with, I go with Right Said Fred. I don't know if Ooh, you guys remember yes. that song. I'm too sexy for my shirt. Yes. That Dion could be that because he, he kind of has that flair and pizzazz. Who and let the dogs out? Yeah, who let the dogs out? Who let the dogs listen, out? He's yeah. putting oh, all the, the chips Baja in. Man. Yeah, the, the Baja, Baja man. man. Yes. Yeah. Baja boys. Baja, Baja, Baja boys. Baja yeah. <laughs> but when you put all your chips in like that, it's either all or nothing because if he if, if they have a horrible season, I think the the media kind of goes away and then in a couple seasons he's he's gone. Oh, media's never going away from Dion. No, no. Uh, so here's my let me run out my second okay. batch of one hit ones. These are the honorable mentions. Uh, Tim Tebow, his NFL, his NFL. He had the great playoff run. We're talking about his NFL deal, not college. Steve, he ended up his his career on the punt team as an up back for Rex Ryan. Now that is I, versatility. <laughs> if, you, if you brought back two platoon football, that'd be your quarterback. I'll tell you that much. You would just wildcat your team four yards in a cloud of. But wait, wait, greatest college quarterback, maybe. Yeah, yeah, but you're just going. I just to say the NFL runs a little. Let me get through unfair. my list. Let me get through my yeah. list. Then you can out pick for the ball. Jaguars a tight end last year. Come on, <laughs> Tilla Tequila. Does anybody Tila remember? Tequila. 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 Yeah. Tequila. Yeah, she was pretty shameful to crouching yeah. tigers. I can't lie. Yeah. Uh, this is a guy. These guys were all telling me about this morning that I remember the name, but again, I don't remember him as a comedian. I, you know, I guess he was Dane Cook. Uh, he had a good he had a good run, but unfortunately he made a bunch of bad movies. So that's the thing. His comedy, his tours sold out. He had about four sold out arena tours, but his movies as, or were flopped. It him. was one bit called The Vicious Cycle, I think is what it was. And turns out I think he stole most of those jokes. He did from Louis C.K. He had I thought a decent movie, Good Luck Chuck, with Jessica Alba. That is the only one that I remember. I don't know any of his no other. No one ones. remembers that movie. And it turns out his brother stole all of his money and went to prison. And so nobody's heard his name ever since. I mean, Dane Cook. Yes. You know much about Dane Cook? Uh, I knew that a lot of people didn't think he was funny, which was an issue for a comedian. <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of a problem. And then uh, Jeremy Lin. Oh, see, Jeremy okay, okay yeah. first that's of a, all. That's a tough one for me. What do you mean uh, well, that, that, that kindled your relationship? Well, it, it kind of did. Uh, here's the thing with Jeremy Lin. He had a great three-week stretch. And then Carmelo Anthony, just what he did to that whole thing should be considered Asian hate. Because he doused fire all over it, and then it was over with. But Jeremy Lin, I I will say this, though. He actually had a multi-year NBA career, though. Remember, he was a Laker. Eight seasons. Eight seasons. That's tough to do. That's tough to do. So, look, he had a good... Insanity happened for two or three weeks. Yeah, right. Nearly got me canceled. He's the one who. I was the one guy that said I thought the joke was funny but untrue. I don't want to talk, tell the joke here. The, the thing that got me, Jeremy Lin, they did an HBO documentary on this like two years ago. I thought it was the biggest piece of trash I've ever was seen. I trashed in the documentary? Did they? No, but oh, they, had, they had the usual suspects talking about the Asian culture, the hate. They had Pablo Torre crying about how tough it is to be an Asian. Pablo, it's not that bad. We usually live okay. We always have the newest PlayStations. They it's have not that, that tough being Asian growing up here. It really isn't. Did they have the headline when he fell a chink in his armor? Yes, that was a large part of it. Yeah. And I, I could honestly tell you that most non-media members of, of the Asian culture did not care. It, it, it was like when, you know, like that owner, McNair, got into trouble for inmates running the asylum. It, it, look, it's a something that's been said for years Truth be told, most Asians that I know don't even care about Otani. We really don't. He's a good ball. Shohei. Uh, Shohei Otani. Even the Japanese people in California that I know, it's not like they hang on every angel box score. It's just a little bit different. We don't care. We just want to run our dry cleaners. We want our kids to make the honor roll and make UCLA. (laughs) Everything else is not really that important. I I added one more that uh, Jason didn't like. Peyton Hillis was on the cover of Madden. A great 2007. Yes. 
eight or nine? Eight or nine. Cover of Madden, and then didn't hear his name until he saved his child from drowning. Like, yeah. He, How are you going to be a one-hit wonder when you just saved two kids' lives and, went and, all nearly, <laughs> and nearly died yourself? How are you going to be a one-hit wonder when you won the Heisman Trophy? I mean, we're making different rules right. for different people here. <laughs> Maybe, he, he only won it once, though, didn't he? He won, it, he won two <laughs> national titles. Well, two national titles, but one national Heisman. Title. Now, was, he, was, he is the forgotten member of the, one of the greatest backfields ever. It was it was Felix Jones and Darren McFadden. Run DMC. Yes. Run DMC out of Arkansas. That's right. Um, and I want to say, if you're going to talk about Tim Tebow being the greatest college quarterback ever, one of my opinions that everyone disagrees with, I think Tommy Frazier might be the greatest uh, college quarterback ever. He came this close to winning three national titles. And in 95, I thought he ran the option as well as anybody. So if you want to say one-hit wonder, well, he never made the NFL. All he See, that's why it's tough to call these guys one-hit wonders. Well, well, you know what? There was an Asian rapper who used to kill 106 in Park. His name Jin. was Jin. And he got done the same way they did Lin. You know why? Because he didn't have the right culture. Mm, you see, if he, that. if he was hip hop, if, if Jeremy Lin was more of a hip hop guy and was hanging out with rappers the and Rough doing Rider stuff, signed in, him. exactly. <laughs> the Rough Rider signed him. I bought that album. I bought that album. He was an actually good artist. But I think what happened with Jeremy Lin is that he didn't, he didn't understand his pecking order. He came to every team. I, I watched a YouTube clip the other day where Kobe was like, "Give me the ball," and Jeremy Lin was like, "No, nah, I got this." And he hit the three. But after that, Kobe was like, "There can't be two alphas here." It's be the me or him, and then they got rid of Jeremy. Mm. That's a pretty easy choice. <laughs> exactly. I would, I would agree. Yeah, exactly. I would agree. <laughs> All right, uh, great job. We're going to let Steve Kim go. We're going to bring Anthony out here, do some Tennessee Harmony, wrap up for us some Beyond discussion. Next. only reason I can follow and understand and support everything you just said is because of Donald Trump. He opened my eyes to the level of corruption, made me do the research so that I could even follow what you just said and fully understand it. And that's why I have a sense of loyalty. And I think a lot of people have a sense of loyalty. And he's the reason why I have so much respect for you. And, and understand, and, and I said, because Trump's taking a risk and he's being somewhat courageous for different reasons. But I understand how much more courageous you are given your family's history and what you're taking on. And so that, that's why it's hard for me not to begin a conversation talking about Trump, because when I start thinking about, because you argued that we're being divided, blacks, whites, and it's all just a game. And, and I see him as central to opening people's minds up so that we can get past some of these superficial differences and completely understand exactly what you're talking about and do something about it. All right, welcome back. I'm gonna do some Tennessee Harmony on uh, Deion Sanders. Anthony Walker joining us here in studio. Virgil joining us via Skype from Atlanta. Uh, TJ Moe and Jamar Johnson still in studio with me. Full house here today on uh, Fearless. Anthony, if you could uh, start us with a prayer. Father God, we are so thankful for your blessings, uh, your grace, and your mercy. Father, uh, we recognize that you are God. You have made it all, created it all, and we are just your creation. Help us to be more like Jesus. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So uh, yesterday we did a, obviously a show on Dion, and then we did a Twitter Spaces uh, conversation uh, about Dion last night. And in that conversation, uh, Delano was on the Twitter Spaces, and, and Delano started unpacking an analogy or sharing, not an analogy, sharing that perhaps part of my problem or part of what I was talking about, my criticism of Dion, is a byproduct of Dion being involved with uh, Pastor T.D. Jakes and the prosperity gospel. And, and when I heard Delano unpacking this, it triggered in me like, like, oh my God, Dion Sanders is Mike Todd. He's basically the Mike Todd of college football. I love the analogy, 
Delano and Anthony did not love the analogy. And so we thought, hey, we would continue the conversation uh, here on Tennessee Harmony and just get a more biblical conversation about what we think is going on with Deion Sanders and what our take is on, on, on Deion Sanders. Because part of the standard that I've been holding Deion to is he's wearing his faith on his sleeve and he's putting that front and center. And so I think that elevates things. And, and I'm someone who was a backsliding, closeted Christian. And, and part of that reason was like I was living so foully and my actions weren't in alignment with my Christian views. Like, I'm not going to wear this on my sleeve. And then I started wearing it on my sleeve because I figured out that's the only way I'm going to get rid of <laughs> these behaviors that are plaguing me and causing me to make mistakes. I had to apply a standard to myself that would elevate my behavior, my thoughts, my worldview, my actions. And so <clears throat> Dion and I are the same age. I, I, he, he's wearing his faith, but I don't think his behavior is consistent with that. And, and so I just started thinking about Mike Todd and like, I think Dion could have some temporary success here. He built up a big congregation, a lot of Colorado football fans, win some games, make everybody a lot of money, uh, become very, very popular, but will he save any souls? And as a football coach, will he help build up young men? Uh, and that's where I think perhaps he'll fall flat. And anybody that's followed this show or Tennessee Harmony knows that uh, when we started, I was a big Mike Todd fan. And then Anthony and Delano and Virgil started tearing into Mike Todd. <laughs> and I, my eyes got opened. And anyway, uh, I want to pick back up there. I will let Anthony go first. Why is my analogy wrong? Then we'll hear from Virgil. And TJ was on uh, the Twitter spaces last night. And we'll get Jamar. But Anthony, get us rolling. Why, why am I wrong? About I'm going to pick up on what, where Delano left off. Um, the primary job of Dion right now as a head coach of a college football team is to coach the kids. That's his primary job. And by coaching – Especially with college football, you're looking at recruiting, you're looking at money generation for the team, for the school, and then you're also looking at wins, obviously, the X's and O's. Um, a secondary part of a head coach's job absolutely is developing these young men. It's primary in importance, but that's their secondary job. You're hiring them to be a coach. Mike Todd, his primary job is to tell the truth from the word of God. You're saying that they're similar in personality, they're similar in their flashiness, et cetera. Mike Todd is not even doing his primary job. Dion, now his two college coaching stops, he has recruited very well. He has won, especially at Jackson State. He's won his first game here at TCU. Um, he's generating a lot of money, a lot of fan base for the so as from a college football head coach standard, he's taking care of primary. His secondary task, the way that I would look at it from a biblical perspective, the number one person that's responsible for making sure my kids are developed, my son is developing to a young man, my daughter is developing to a young woman, that's me and their mom. Like, that's our family. That's, that's supposed to take place there. I send them there. My expectation for Dion is only going to be, or any college coach, is only going to be secondary to what my primary responsibility as the discipler of my family is supposed to be. So I see where you were going, looking at their personality, et cetera, but Mike Todd's not even taking care of primary task. He's not even doing that one. Mm, Virgil, <coughs> your thoughts. Yeah, I, I, don't, I can't remember a time where I completely disagreed with my brother Anthony, <laughs> but this day has arrived. I knew it was so, coming. Yeah, yeah it, it has arrived. I, I think I think I think my brother he he reached out to me as the game was happening. I think we 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 uh, texted one another kind of back and forth. I think he was checking the temperature gauge on how I was I was uh, tracking with all of this stuff. But here here's what I'll lay out. I think Deion Sanders is a is a net positive for college football. Uh, he's a net positive for the University of of Colorado. However, he is a net negative for uh, uh, being a Christian role model uh, for young men. He is a net negative. 
uh, as the fruit of uh, prosperity gospel preaching and poor discipleship. He's a he's the fruit of men like T.D. Jakes and 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 Creflo Dollar and and Mike Todd. Um, you know, it's one thing for him to promote himself. It's a whole nother thing for him to 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 add to think that the way to for young men to grow would be through the use of pride and self promotion. That that would be their way to greatness. Um, I was listening to what what Anthony said that his primary job is to uh, coach kids and and uh, and to and then and then thereafter to build men uh, and use college football to to do it. I don't think those two things are dichotomous. I don't think you can do one and not the other. Uh, and as a believer, as one who professes Christ, I believe he has a higher call, a responsibility to ensure that the manner in which he uses football, first of all, glorifies God and honors him in every way. And then by, by example, he draws, he uses that platform to draw other men to Christ as well. And so again, you can build up young men and teach them the fundamentals of football to the highest level, which, which, which uh, you know, Dion has demonstrated. He absolutely has uh, the skill set and the ability to, to navigate. Uh, he can do both. Uh, and, and while for someone who didn't, does not profess Christ, yes, their primary role is just to make sure they, they win football games. But as a Christian, as a believer, who has been given the great commission, he has a responsibility to whom he will answer to Christ for, for how he leveraged his platform to draw others unto himself. So uh, slight disagreement with both you guys, <clears throat> and that would be uh, professing Christian or not, having been in a locker room with very, very good coaches, there is no primary and secondary roles. There's only primary role. And your job as a football coach is to win games and to develop men. Those are on equal footing. I don't think right. you put one than the other. One certainly allows you to keep your job longer. You, you have to win. If you're just developing men and not winning games, you're going to lose your job. But I, there is no primary, secondary right. to me. And I, and I think looking at it that way, I hate speaking from a position of authority, so just take this with a grain of salt, whatever. You guys all here at my heart on this, having been in locker rooms and experiencing it, um, I feel for these kids who aren't getting it, they're being mm -hmm. deprived. Deion Sanders enjoyed the fruits of Bobby Bowden, and that's the, the father figure discipleship that he got, and he now is refusing to give that to his kids, and that's unfair, and I think it's cruel. He knows what it's supposed Refusing to be. Refusing is wrong is a strong word, okay. not wrong. Right. But um, he's maybe derelict. Yeah. yeah, whatever it would be. And yeah. he, at this point, does not seem to be providing that. Certainly, from the outward appearance, and I don't know how you could take it any other way, of the giant boulder of pride that's sitting in his life. And I just, I don't think you can disciple young men when you have that issue. The, the pride that he exhibits will always keep him from being a good father figure. I, I don't think you can do it because everything's always about you. He's a narcissist. Everything's about Dion, everything he does. How can you claim to be trying to take care of 85 scholarship kids and 127 or so on the team when all you can think about is yourself all day long and all you do is promote yourself and talk about what Dion did and prime time. And don't you dare call me Dion. You call me Coach Prime. And, and so to, to me, uh, I, I'm, I'm so far beyond football. I actually think, you know, Jason and I have had a lot of discussion about how sports used to be this force for good. Forever it was this force for good. But, um, you told me last night at Ball State at any given time you'd have 10 guys with, reading your Bible inside the locker room. And, and mm -hmm. my locker room wasn't quite like that, but we had guys, serious professing Christians that would be, we, we had Bible studies where we would sit in and kick around biblical ideas, prominent starters on the team. It was, it was not hidden. Um, and so it was that I'm to a point today where I'm actually happy watching, we just got done with our ESPN discussion, watching the importance and popularity of sports decline. Because we got guys like Dion trying mm -hmm. to tell you sports are about something different, and I don't buy it. Mar, God, family, and country. That's what we were taught in the military. And of course, there's God, family, and football, if football is your focus. Faith, family, and football is a very popular right? slogan. Very popular mm -hmm. slogan. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so when you have someone who is proclaiming something, but then actually doing something else, remember, people follow what you do, not what you say. So his example is really misleading people because what I say is, Dion is leaving a unfollowable example. 
Mm-hmm. Because unless you are the 1% top athlete who can do what Dion did over his career, you don't have the leeway to run around bloviating and, and pumping your chest like that. Now, there's another example that's a little bit different. He wasn't coaching in the professional or college ranks, but look at LeVar Ball. Look how he got his kids' attention, and now he's, he's vanished. But would you want to follow that example? Is that what you want to put forth? So I, so I think it's a very dangerous road, and I'll just give you one example. You know, I had, when, when you're a new officer on the ship, I was in the Marine Corps first, and I was a naval officer. When you're an officer on the ship, you usually see two captains before you depart, right? Two completely different styles. Now, my first captain was fire and brimstone, and he led with fear. Right. Mm -hmm. And so he got the job done and he said, hey, I didn't mean to yell at you, but I I was just doing it to teach you something. But then you would see him go out in town and do all sorts of stuff that were un, un, you wouldn't follow this as a leader. Years later in the Navy Times, it comes out that he was in bed with the wrong people doing business deals that he shouldn't have been doing. And then all circles back. So in my mind, you can't say one thing and do another. And, and to me, the way he's acting is not very Christian-like at all. I, I had a conversation this morning with Chuck Knox because he was briefly on our Twitter spaces last night and didn't chime in. He, he's probably on for 20, 30 minutes. And I was like, just called him to say, hey, I meant to get you in, blah, blah, blah. And then he made his point to me that I thought was, was interesting about in terms of the example Dion is setting that, that's dangerous, that <clears throat> he's setting an example of like, in Chalk Knox's mind, and I agree with, I'm not hiding behind Chalk Knox or Dave Shannon, that, that Dion's easily triggered. Mm. And, and too many, that's an issue for young black men. Disrespect. And you know we, we have all these fights and or shootings about disrespect and don't this whole dis culture, and 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 what Dion is basically arguing again, you diss me, someone in the media diss me, they didn't believe in me, mm-hmm. and and you know I, I'm keeping receipts on that, and when I get a chance to embarrass you or diss you, I'm going to diss you, mm-hmm. and that's what he did to Ed Werder who. Yeah, a tweet <laughs> from March or whatever. That that's wasn't what, even a diss. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it was Kendall just Browse and and again, uh, just being transparent. Obviously, you guys have seen Art Browse, Kendall Browse's dad, on this show. The Browses really deeply religious and Christian, and they have a narrative about the story that Dion has put out. But it, it's all these diss tracks that, and that's where Dion carries himself like a rapper. The gold chains. He's done some rapping. And so I I just, as a Christian, I just, I can't be involved in dis culture and and being, oh my, someone dissed me and I got to disrespect them. I I, I just reject all of that. And then the, 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 the transition I'm asking Dion to make is the same transition I had to make. In terms of just like the things I was man that were manifesting in my life directly contradicted my stated Christian values. And, and I needed to get somewhere where the work that I produced, the content, it's like God gave me this gift, talk show, writer. I had to figure out a way to where I could use these gifts to glorify him. And, and that's what I think I, I'm just, what I think Virgil or someone says, you know, use that football experience the way Tony Dungy used it to glorify him, God. Not Tony Dungy, God. And, and, and that is all of our callings. That's, you know, obviously as a minister, <laughs> you're really all in. Yeah. Uh, but he, as a talk show host, I'm trying to get all in. And as a sports writer, I'm trying to get all in. And, and when you, Dion as a football coach, many, and this didn't uh, come up last night, but they've had success at Colorado before. Mm-hmm. Major success. With Bill McCartney, who used football to start the Promise Keepers ministry mm. and, and all that. He led with God. 
I'm sure he's a flawed man and imperfections or whatever, but the only, when Colorado had its most success, I think played for a national championship, did five, they win one? Five downs to do it, but don't give me yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. uh, but, but it was with a coach who led with his faith and and so I, I'm just I'm not I, obviously I'm still not comfortable uh, with what Dion's doing here and 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 I, I he's made a lot of money because of the gifts that God blessed him with uh, and and having had to make the sacrifice and having you know I, I Virgil wasn't it yesterday that I called you whining and complaining I know I called TJ whining and complaining about like man this is hard. Nothing's going right for me. Right. I, right. I literally, I told one of y'all, maybe both of y'all, I was like, I'm, this is the best version of me that's ever existed, but things are much, and, and, and that ain't very good. That's, the bar is low. <laughs> uh, but, but things aren't going the way that I want, and I'm not, you know, Men, uh, men are, are just, they're not men of their word like they used to be, a handshake. We had a situation yesterday, someone had agreed to do something uh, for me and, and just threw a curveball at the last minute. And I'm just like, you just, I grew up in a time, because again, I'm 56, where, where a man's word used to have a lot of value and it just doesn't have, and so I'm whining and complaining about like, Man, I done made a lot of sacrifices. How come I ain't getting the rewards? How come I? And, and thankfully, Virgil and TJ, you know, talked me out of it, and I didn't have to call you, Anthony. Uh, <laughs> but but it, it's it, it's a very and again, someone tweeted at me yesterday, and I I pointed out like, hey man, I and again, it's because where my mind was at, there's going to be a tiny remnant that's going to choose that very narrow path. Right. And, and I just have to remember that, that quit feeling sorry for yourself. You chose to be a part of that remnant. You're going to be on that narrow path. Don't expect everybody else to follow you down that road. Quit feeling sorry for yourself. Something yeah. that I've been thinking, because actually it, it relates to that too. Christianity, while it's an individual sport between you and Jesus, it's, it's a team sport in that we need this badly. Yeah. And so yeah. when we're feeling what you were feeling yesterday and this mm -hmm. week, you're supposed to be able to call me and Anthony and Virgil yeah. and Jamar. It's a yeah. team sport. It, yeah. I can connect this to Dion. Dion didn't play a team sport. He was a corner. He was on an island by himself all the time. He didn't know the first thing about team football. And he coaches like that. And so he doesn't, the locker room and all that stuff, it's an individual sport for him. And Christianity is not an individual sport, certainly not on this level. There's a reason we have Bible studies instead of individual studies. Mm -hmm. And you have to be able to connect the whole thing. And so. I, look, I think offensive linemen are probably fantastic head coaches. If you, if you don't have it, you need two guys blocking to get to the linebacker. It is funny. There is a profile for coaches, that safeties, because they have to see the whole defense and see the whole field and everything that impacts them. Middle linebackers to the same degree, but defensive linemen are bad head coaches. Corners tend to be really bad head coaches. Uh, and... and uh, Running backs, bad coaches, uh, <laughs> but centers, and and off of Andy Reid's offensive linemen, yeah. and quarterbacks, wide receivers, bad coaches for the Devils. Further away receivers. from the ball you are, the worse you are <laughs> as a head. Debo Sweeney was a wide receiver, so that contradicts it a little bit. But he's also a big believer. But anyway, yeah. Anthony, you want to? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know the 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 framing i'm always answering you based off the framing of the question the framing of the question is dion and mike todd uh, mm -hmm. is dion good for college football but we're really discussing his consistency in his faith the mm -hmm. the hypocrisy of speaking one thing living another we're going to talk on that framing i look at the reason why i set the bar low for dion and many head coaches is because of the hypocrisy I've seen documentaries. I've been in locker rooms, not on that level, to where the coach before the family, before the media, before everybody else, buttoned up, yes ma'am, and all this kind of stuff. They get in the locker room, profanity laden, doing whatever they can to motivate you. And these are guys that you may see at the prayer breakfast. And, I, and I'm seeing this thinking, wait, I thought this guy was. And so in that Christian walk, 
I'm like, okay, who is this guy? But because of the persona that he puts forth, we come up with a, well, he must be, you know, he uh, uses this. You brought up on the on the uh, Twitter space, you know, some great coaches who are, you know, kind of closeted Christians. You know, they have a faith, but they're not very vocal about it, et cetera. When we accept the gospel, when we obey the gospel of Christ, when we are uh, accept that great commission, boldness comes with it. There isn't a space of, well, I got to kind of keep this quiet because I'm on a college campus and I don't want them to. It's so dangerous out here. No, that's where we need the most bold and brash. Mm -hmm. So I would put them to say, yeah, you may not wear it on your sleeve. You still claim the blood of Christ, but we're still not living it out. I'm going to say the same thing about Dion. You are arrogant. You are self bloviating. I get all of that. I'm speaking on college football level. There are some coaches out there who are winners, who are popular, who are generating, and they may have, they may be a Christian, but because they don't really say it out loud, uh, I'm gonna, if that's gonna be a flaw for them, I'm gonna say this is a flaw for Dion. This is a flaw, but as a college coach, I mean, he's he's and then, you know, the other thing I'll say and then we'll turn it back. What we looked at last night where college football is now, it yeah. is prime for prime time. Sure. The transfer portal has turned down the team aspect back in the day. You know, you had to stay with your team. The NIL deals. Everybody's an individual. I, I, I'm time. I don't want to twist your meaning. So sure, sure, sure. separate. I'm talking to the audience and Anthony. Separate what I'm about to say. It's not a direct. I got you. I'm not trying gotcha, to. But, but, gotcha. but part of what I've been dealing with emotionally as I look out at the world is the whole world has been primed for Satan yes. and success for Satan. And so that's how I heard what you just gotcha. said. Gotcha. Like, yeah, you know, the, you're right. College football is now primed for someone to come in and be mm -hmm. highly fraudulent and a bad role model for kids, hypocritical and, and very filled with pride and ego and, and claiming an allegiance mm -hmm. with him while none of their actions are in alignment with him and just mm -hmm. hu humility and trust me, I had to learn it. And, and you know, it's been a real struggle with me. And I, I get, if I had made the money that Dion makes, if I was half as good looking as Dion, I would struggle with humility so much more. Yeah. But I, I just got to see some humility that that's that's one of the initial fruits. I would think you, 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 you would get from any type of authentic relationship with God. And, and Dion seems to think that a lack of humility is his strength. Right. And I just don't know any Christian who believes that. Virgil, go ahead. Yeah, yeah I, I just, man, I, I think for, from, from Anthony's perspective, I, I see the pastor, the pastor's heart come out in him wanting to provide the grace for, for Dion in, in, in that space. That's, nat, that's a natural inclination of of pastors and and at the same time i think there's a prophetic voice and by that i don't mean i don't mean seeing the future i mean declaring truth that 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 has to be stated and not that anthony's not stating that he does that all the time but simply to simply to say this i i think the reason why jason it is so important is is for the very reasons that you laid out uh the reasons that the, the, based upon the conversation that we had there's so much of the world that is absolutely going to hell in a handbasket and especially as it pertains to the building up of men, that we have got to make sure that we point young men, particularly, to what is right and what is wrong. You know, it was it was it was Charles Spurgeon, I believe, who who made the who made the statement as it pertains to discernment. You know, it, knowing it, discernment is not the difference between knowing right from wrong. Discernment is the difference between knowing right and almost right, right. And and what Dion presents is what's almost right and, and as a result we have a tendency to want to latch on to it and go oh that's that looks good it, it, it's really cultural christianity Deion sanders is cultural christianity's version of, of an andrew tate uh as it pertains to mm. selling uh, selling masculinity and and what the modern man should be like the the the, the machissimo the the bravado the showman right 
but there's another aspect of masculinity that that is is humble that still is powerful that still is effective but maintains the level of humility necessary to manage themselves in every other area of life that 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 bravado may work on a football field but if you keep that self-promoting chest pumping thing going as it pertains to your work as it pertains to being a husband as it pertains to being a father that's going to be a detriment to you in those other areas and at the end of the day that's what matters most are we not it's not about are we building football players are we building men because what we need in our in our country in our culture are more men Virgil I, I want to piggyback off that and it's piggyback off Jamar too is is Dion on the football field gets away with all that bravado because he's He's not even in the one percent. He's in the point one one percent. Yeah, right. he's in just a. He's one of the greatest athletes to ever hit this earth, and and what happens is, take take me as a sports writer. God bless me with some gifts that have nothing to do with me. It's it's just a gift, mm -hmm. and so there's corners I could cut. And that others couldn't, mm -hmm. and and you have to recognize, like, oh man. So Dion starts interpreting his flaws as part of his strength, mm -hmm. and oh, it's the bravado. That's why I was able to make it. And and what he does in that Colorado locker room, maybe Travis Hunter is almost close to Dion. Maybe no one else in that locker room is, mm -hmm. and most of those other guys. He, there's. If there's 10 guys in that locker room that'll make it in the NFL, of those 10, eight of them will play for two or three years. They won't acquire generational wealth. Mm -hmm. And then they're going to have to survive off of, well, what did I learn from Dion, my Colorado experience, mm -hmm. from my whole life that I can apply to the rest of my life? How am I going to make it? And, and Dion's with his behavior. Again, he may be doing different things in the locker room. He's not providing. He's setting an example that, that will lead them to bring all that bravado and gold chains and swagger into, again, just like I'm repeating verbs, bring it into your marriage. Watch how that goes. Mm -hmm. you, you'll be at the strip club with old Jason Whitlock. You'll be out chasing younger girls. Because again, that mentality, that bravado creates the entitlement. Why, why do you think I was running around at 40 trying to date 25-year-old women? I felt entitled. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I had so much money and I had so much popularity. I felt entitled. That, that my bravado, pride, arrogance, a lack of humility, it creates an entitlement that and, and that's what Dion's problem with Florida State. He feels entitled mm. to be their head coach. Mm -hmm. I don't have. I didn't need to do what all these other coaches did. Start as a graduate and said, "I'm Dion Sanders. I'm the greatest player. I'm entitled." And y'all didn't give it to me. F y'all. Y'all racist. Mm. That's. So I think we should define some terms here because, it, it, particularly with Anthony, I think we're having two separate conversations. Where if we clarified some things, I think we would agree on a lot more. Um, it seems like, Anthony, and correct me if I'm wrong here, you're trying to separate the football from the rest and what it means to be a successful football coach. And I don't, I can't term it that way. A successful football coach is just not just somebody who wins championships. And, and if you go look at the College Football Hall of Fame, those are a bunch of builders of men. Virtually every last one, particularly in the old college football world. And the last three years, it's seriously changed. But you're not a success to me. And so when we say that person's had a lot of success, if you can't point to a bunch of guys that still talk to you and say, hey, coach, remember when you taught me that? That changed my life. If you can't do that, then you're not a successful football coach to me. Here's where Dion would say he'd whip his phone out and show you 200 NFL players that text him every day and right. th oh, Dion, you – did X, Y, and Z for me, and blah, blah, blah. And then he'll show you another 500 non-NFL players that text him and thank him. Coach, you did this or that for me, you did. So in his mind, and based on what's in his cell phone, he's had a positive impact on a lot of guys. Yeah, and so <clears throat> I, I would, 
tell you that based on his behavior, certainly, he's scripturally illiterate. And so what it means to be a mm -hmm. biblical man is certainly not what he portrays. Philippians 2, 3, do nothing out of selfish, selfish ambition or yes. pride, but in humility consider others more important than yourself. And here's what Dion does, and this drives me insane because he puts his Christianity out there. I'm better than y'all, and you know that, and God wanted that, and that's why. So just admit it. God made me this way, brother. <laughs> this is just who I am. I'm prime time, and I'm not on board with that. And so you can't set that example, and you just said, good luck bringing that into your marriage. You're guaranteeing a divorce, probably in the first year. Good luck bringing that into a friendship and having anybody. When Dion doesn't have his popularity and his money, see what kind of friend he is. It's that sort of attitude, because he thinks he's better than everyone, and he thinks God made him that way, and you should just acknowledge it. It makes me think of a concept called fool's gold. Yep where it appears to be real. And maybe you can exchange it with a few people because they don't know any better. But what happens is that there's this projection now where a lot of people are like, yeah, I'm so proud of him because a black man is standing up and he's, he's, he's taking it to the chin for us, right? But what happens is you go into the workplace, you bring that attitude to the workplace, nobody wants to work with you. You don't get things done with that type of an attitude. So maybe that works on the football field for the 1% who make it to the professional ranks. But when you're out in the world living, you've got to figure out how to work with people. And that attitude will get you nowhere fast and in a hurry. And with the decadent veil collapsing, there's going to be less opportunities. So your ability to work well with others is the only thing you're going to have. I'm going to say this for me, and, and we got to wrap this up. But I, I will give Anthony and Virgil one final comment, but I, I'm, I'm gonna say this for me, and, and I'd like for Anthony and Virgil to correct me if I'm, I'm wrong or if this experience is, is just a one-off, but for me, when I think about my father and when I think about my football coaches in college, I didn't like them in real time. Mm -hmm. I, I, I was at war with them. Mm -hmm. And, and I knew that they cared about me, particularly my father. But man, he was just on me. And, and it wasn't until years later that I was like, oh my God, my father was so right. Oh my God, Paul Shadell, my head coach at Ball State, I didn't like. The offensive line coach, first one I had there, Dave Magazine, I wrote pieces in my 30s trying to destroy that guy. And, and he was right. Hmm. Paul said that they were right. And so to me, and again, I know Dion's uh, cell phone is filled with everybody sending him flowers and thank you for this and thank you for that. I I'm not sure if a proper male relationship, discipling another male, if you should be getting those flowers in real time, because we're not mature enough to interpret what actually the real gifts are. And so what TJ saying as far as the winning and, and my senior year at Ball State, we should have went 11 and 0, we went eight and three, it was a very good team. None of that winning matters. It was the relationships, the lessons that I learned mm -hmm. and all that. And that really is what a successful coach, a successful man, again, another man can't even really figure out the real gifts that were passed on to him until years down the road. I think of my cousin Josh, who I love like, you know, my own child that came to live with me for two years in Kansas City, and it was tough. <laughs> it was tough, because I rode him. This dude's now 37, 38 years old. Every time we get on the phone, it's all about what you told me then, when he was 15, 16 years old. And he, he left and mad at me, blah, blah, blah. But as a man, as a grown man, he's like, oh my God, Jason, everything you were teaching me in real time, I now apply it. And he went through a rough stretch and all that other stuff. I think of Dante Love. You know, I had to be really hard. And I, I left, this, <laughs> this dude was driving one of my, I left him in the middle of the street in LA, took everything from him. You walk your, rear end home, I'm done with you. And didn't speak to the dude for six months. Dude loves me. He, he's wife, two kids, third one on the way, great career going. But we had some hard times. But on the other side is he's matured. And so that's what, to me, a discipling relationship looks and feels like that, that has real benefits. 
Whereas, again, you can, you know, I'm sure everybody's texting Dion and telling him he's the greatest thing in the world, but, you know, who, who, who knows what, what they're looking at and what, the, you know, I used to think the people that overfed me at Thanksgiving were doing me a mm. favor. Were they? <laughs> Anyway, uh, Virgil, Anthony, uh, you guys get the final. So as it relates to Dion, I, I think, and I, and I appreciate what you were saying, TJ, about you know, how I'm looking at it. From a biblical space, uh, Jesus says, by your fruit, you will know them. Yes. So from a Christian standpoint, I'm looking through that lens to see, is he really a Christian? I know what he says. But is his life really demonstrating that of Christ? And, and that tells me whoever I'm dealing with, claim it or not, I'm going to look at your fruit to tell me who you are. And, and that sets it. The other side to it is maybe my expectation for coaches as it relates to discipling is very low because of what Sports has become because of what money and media has become the way that I was brought up and the way that I bring up my kids. You know, the standard is set from God's word and the standard of, of living it out is going to be set here at home. And when you get outside of this house, you're going to go work at a job. Hey, learn what you can eat the meat, spit out the bones. You're going to go to school someday. Hey, learn what you can, eat the meat, spit out the bones. And that's the approach. So my expectation for a coach, and, and there's, there are coaches, great coaches, that are great motivators, great leaders, great teachers. And, and that, that's, that's good. My expectation for discipling, and I believe it's biblically backed, is at home. The chief discipler of our kids is father at home. So if you... Take a, a society that's built on or that has a prevalence of broken homes, broken marriages, single moms, single fathers, and we're throwing them to schools and universities. The expectation is, OK, I need you to take my son and make him into a man because we couldn't do it here at the house. I'm saying when you made the point about society being built for Satan, I'm with that. I agree with that. And I'm saying because of that. My expectation is not for the coach. My expectation is not for NFL or NBA or whomever else. My expectation is for building strong homes to where when they get to this particular level, no, nah, I can't I, I can't be with that because it, it ain't it ain't even really feeding my life spiritually. Virgil, final word and uh, we gotta get out of here. Yeah, I'll I'll quickly I'll quickly say this. Dion has, has said that what he is doing in coaching, it's, it's a calling. And when he uses that language, he's, he's, he's giving a hat tip to something bigger than being a coach, something spiritual. Uh, that's something to be considered. Coaching, like teaching, is discipleship. And he has a responsibility as a professed believer uh, to think about the lens he's using to coach, to disciple these young men. I think all of us have, have alluded to it. It's right now, it doesn't look good. Uh, our hopefulness is that it, things will change. Uh, and I think the true test, the true tale of the, of, of the tape will be when that team as a whole runs into adversity uh, and, and has a difficult time moving forward. You'll find out the stuff they're made of. Thank you, Virgil. Uh, great job, everybody. Wow, we just had a marathon show. Hope you guys love it. Tomorrow, remember, 4 o'clock, our, our Fun Slinger football kickoff show, 4 o'clock Central, we'll start things. We'll go to about 7 o'clock, right before kickoff of the first NFL game. Uh, we'll play some harmony, and we'll see you tomorrow. up so divided stop fighting and stand tall we used to be a nation one united now we're headed for a downfall gotta let your light shine down what we need more than anything now to wake up Choose love, my sister
to my brother See through the lies you tell us Cause together we're so much stronger God let your light shine down What we need more than anything now Harmony Let's make a simple vow Let's come together now Get to me Open up your eyes and see 